this isn't live, so we can edit anything out if there's anything like you um, want to change. That's not the way I operate. <laughs> I like that. And that look, whatever, whatever I say is what I say. I'll, and you say a lot. Yeah. And I, I, I've got to bear the brunt of um, if I'm not happy with what I say. That's, that's obviously in the moment in time. That's what I wanted to say. Exactly. I just think like people going back and trying to edit it and like make it sound look it's it's a, meant to be a natural conversation exactly yeah. and that's exactly why I really there's with, with a guy like you there's some thing, there's many things I want to touch on mm. and with a guy like you it's like where do you start because I think people look at you like this have we actually started? yeah <laughs> yeah we're, we'll, let me, well hold on I think people look at you like some uh, like super genius in, in holistic health mm. and you think like what are you like your background is in s and c but you're an expert in gut health and blood analysis and blood work and and stress management all these other avenues of of health what do you call yourself i know you've called yourself a generalist right and then i picked up on that i'm like you know what yes that is the avenue that i'm i'm trying to go down to but hey what would you do i'm a generalist (laughs) fuck does that mean yeah, it's a, it's a... So how do you classify yourself? How do you introduce yourself? Yeah, look, it's a question I get asked quite regularly. Like even when I've been a little bit more present on social media and like Instagram and like people commonly ask, um, you know, send me private messages saying like, what? I'm trying to describe to my friend, what are you actually? Yeah. Right. Um, like an alien. <laughs> pretty much and yes one of the things i do say is i'm a generalist it probably doesn't give people a good depiction of really what i'm about yeah okay but my background is more in um strength and conditioning and it is more in you know like obviously the personal training realms and it is more in things like energy systems and it is like that is actually where my background lies yeah okay and i think like i've actually got to a point where some people actually forget that do you know what I mean? So sometimes they don't really have conversations with me about training and so forth. And I go, well, actually, that's my background. Right. Yeah, my background. Like, sh- like lift and stone, yeah. strong man, yeah. calisthenic work. Yeah, my, that's, my background is, is in that realms. Yeah, okay. And actually how I got probably into the realms that I'm more known for now is through being a personal trainer and through dealing with people, I probably got to a point where I just realized – I've got a bunch of people here that I abide by a lot of the things that I was, you know, taught at university and the things that I, you know, that I was taught in particular courses and so forth. And they don't work. Okay. That's what I yeah, want to yeah, talk to you okay. about. You, you went to university. You don't really talk about it. You don't, people plaster like their degrees and their, their university studies in their walls and talk about it, put it in their bios. You don't do that at all. What, what have you no, done? It's a, it's a, it's an unusual thing. It's like, I don't, I don't want you know, even even when I've gone and learned uh, learned independently from from other people, and that might be from you know Charles Poliquin, you know um, you know doing online courses with James Laval, and you know who's a, a pharmacist and a biochemist, and you know uh, uh, you know uh, things like John Barati and precision nutrition, yeah, yeah, great. precision nutrition, and then. You know, functional diagnostics, which is, you know, through Reed, da- Reed Davis in, in the States. And there's a lot of different courses and, and obviously been to university, Victoria University of Technology. And what did you do there? Yeah, so I did like uh, human movement. Yeah, okay. Like a uh, kinesiology? Uh, is it called human movement? Because that's a while it, back. Yeah. It's Before called, exercise science? It's, it's called human movement. Okay. Yeah, okay. So, but like the, the one thing is, is like why I don't talk uh, a lot about these sorts of things is... I don't. The, these things aren't really what define me. Mm. Yeah. Um, like at the end of the day, that like the best part of whenever I've you know learned things, whether it be as I said, what I what I've done with functional diagnostics and what I've done with like um, James Laval and what I've done with Charles Poliquin. The best thing about learning for me is not really what I get at the end of it. Okay. The actual best thing about learning is what I'm getting like the meat and potatoes of it. Uh, and so what I mean by that, it's, it's what drives me is the information. Mm. Yeah, okay. Like it's, so it's really hard to explain because most of the time at the back end of a course, I actually get quite demotivated. Yeah, Why okay? is that? Um, because it's the information that, I, that really um, drives my purpose and my enthusiasm. It's not, it's not to get like a, 
um, like a plaque or it's not to get like a um, or a degree. A certificate, it's, yeah. it's not to get a certificate. Um, it's not really what drives me. Like you, you know, and that's fine. I understand if it drives other people. It's not what drives me. It's information that drives me. Okay, so it's like knowledge that drives me. But what about yeah. what's the value of you think? university and tertiary education now because i think it's so important because so many people you, you've laid the path guys like down there christian these health professionals have laid the path for how to become great but the ways to do it now are endless you don't have to go to university to be a great health professional what but i'm doing it now and i see value in it in my own way what do you see the value of university education in health sciences and would you recommend that for somebody who wants to follow the steps you're in or i'm in i would say a lot of the stuff that i've you know that i've learned through university um look if i look at it a lot of the things that i advocate now and a lot of the things that i really preach is not really in line with that particular model, okay? I, I couldn't say more recently in terms of what they're teaching people and so forth because I'm not really within that realm, so yeah, okay? And that might have changed and it might have improved, yeah, okay? And hopefully it has, yeah, okay? But within the particular framework that I was taught, yeah, okay, um, there was a lot of things that I was using uh, and I was using very early on and really it wasn't helping a lot of people. And of course, there was some people that it was helping helping you know them get results and and helping with their health yeah okay but it was quite a limited amount of people okay and the reason there's a limitation there is because you're getting taught a particular curriculum it's a particular curriculum that doesn't really teach you teach you lateral thinking mm. okay the good thing that probably going to 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 get a, a bachelor's degree or um you know to get a, a certification or is that a lot of the time you've got to learn what's wrong to understand what's right as well. So that's what I would say to people is it's, it's good to understand a particular framework so at least you've got a base, base to actually gauge other information on. Do you think university is that framework? I, as I said, I think, it's, uh, I think it's quite a linear framework. Does yeah. that make sense? Coming from a particular point of view. But once again, if you just think that everything that you get taught at university is gospel, then that's a mistake. Yeah, okay? Because a lot of the best things that I got taught were actually within private mentorship mm -hmm. and, you know, like actually paying good money to learn from some of the best coaches around the world. And that, you know, actually one of the best people that I, that I ever learned from um, who was one of the best teachers I've ever had was actually Ido Portel, yeah, okay? Now, it's not actually in the realms that I'm actually more known for, but I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna say in terms of how much I got out of two five-day private internships with a very, very small group of people with Ido Portel, you know, someone who really understands how the body works, how the body moves, but also understands physiology, also understands psychology, understanding all those aspects. He, he, because I would actually classify Ido, even though his realms is movement, I'd actually classify him as a generalist because I could even have a conversations on some of my strong areas, which would be more things like blood markers and gut health. And I could have a deep, deep conversation with him about these things, yeah, okay? And so what I learned in five days with Ido Portel, and that it cost me an extraordinarily large amount of money, yeah, Was okay? it one-on-one -on -one or was it a small group? Small group. Uh, we had about five to six people, yeah, okay? And th yes, it was a, a huge investment, yeah, okay? Um, but some of the best money I've ever spent because I walked away from that really having such a huge understanding of where we're going wrong with how we're teaching people um about how their body moves and so what is that what was the takeaway from that well a lot of, a lot of the time in just in, in terms of like because his understanding of biomechanics is phenomenal and even when it comes to biomechanics we might be getting taught quite a, a linear uh, approach to how the body moves like you know if i just give you a couple of examples without going too far into the movement realms yeah okay but you know we might look at something like the the, the the knee joint yeah okay yes it's a complex joint yeah okay but how we sort of describe it is really based on that sort of university framework and that anatomy framework and that basically says well it's a hinge joint yeah. okay so if i classify something as a hinge joint your brain is just going to go well you know it's just going to be 
just how an, a hinge operates okay and you're going forwards and backwards and there's not a lot of complex movement through the the knee joint but you actually look at it look at the structure of the knee joint yeah okay you've got you've got like meniscus cartilage yeah okay you've got the anterior cruciate the posterior cruciate which actually allows you to pivot yes yeah rotation. okay yeah the knee so, has some rotation yeah, yeah well it has it, it actually does like transverse movement now look at a basketball player and i think you're going to get a good understanding of how the knee joint moves mm. okay um and so there's a lot of complexity in the knee joint okay which 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 also means that you're you're getting inversion yeah okay you're getting you're getting movement going inwards you're going the knees going medial side it's going lateral side yeah okay and and, and it, it can be quite extreme yeah okay the action the amount of pressure that you actually put on the knee joint now if we just say it's a hinge joint and then all we do yeah, okay is work it in that linear sort of fashion and we're not working it in you know transverse patterns and putting more importantly putting actual pressure on the knee joint yeah okay getting a lot of things like forward knee progression loading the knee yeah okay because a lot obviously the, you know the old framework was you know don't put the knee over the toe yeah don't put the knee over the yeah. toe which we know like actually one thing to help the knee we need to do a lot more knee over toe movements a lot more things like split squats and so forth but they're still quite linear those movements yeah okay so what i'm talking about is actually you know um like whether it's animal flow and more of these primal movements yeah okay um you know actually doing knee loading games yeah okay there's there's a game called the inside outside game where you're actually putting pressure on the knee okay now the good thing about putting on pressure on the knee is that you actually break up like the calcification the scar tissue the adhesions yeah okay you want to break that stuff up yeah okay and the more you can break that stuff up you're just going to help with a lot more blood flow. You're going to help with a lot more movement. You're going to actually help with the, the healing process of the of the joints, yeah, okay? And you're going to help with things like synovial fluid, yeah, okay? But I always say you've got to have the building blocks. Maybe we can talk about that, yeah, okay? It's all well and good to say movement, but you also need the building blocks that enable you to get um to to help with that lubrication you know like the synovial fluid hyaluronic acid all these types of things yeah okay so that the, the sort of framework that Ido uh really drilled into me is that there's there's a complexity to the knee and if you if you're not training the knee with complexity when you ask it to do complex movements like in something like basketball mm. well if you've only uh, trained it in a linear in a in a linear way then what's going to happen okay well it's going to be injury yeah okay and, and because we we haven't prepared the knee for chaos okay and the reality with most of the movements we should be doing they're quite chaotic in nature now sport is very chaotic in nature okay well even if we use the example of the spine yeah okay well the, most of the time like even what we're doing here now when we're sitting that it's a, it's basically the spine is in neutral position okay when we sit in a car it's neutral position now most of the time when we teach people to train in that the spine is in a neutral position yeah okay now we look at what's the most common sort of uh, movement pattern that actually causes problems with intervertebral discs so slip discs herniated discs and so it's rotation yeah, okay and so if we've never strengthened the spine in rotation well what, once again once you go and do rotation what do you think is going to happen to the spine mm -hmm. Because you like, I'm not saying that the that the you know keeping the the spine in a neutral position initially when we're just trying to increase, you know, mass and strength within muscle fibers, hundred percent agree. Okay, but at some point we're going to have to progress the the individual. Okay, because you look at the the facet joints, which obviously help with because nerves run through those facet joints and it sends messages from the brain to other organs around the body like the digestive system and so forth well the facet joints in your cervical actually sit on on top of each other okay the facet joints in the thoracic they sit on top of each other the th the, the the facet joints in the lumbar sit in towards each other it's actually a, a different structure okay so actually the facet joints in the cervical and the thoracic are built for transverse movement which means so like, artic like articulation, yeah. yeah, okay? Now, once again, if I tried to get people to do spinal articulation and spinal waves, just can't do it because most of the time they're operating in a, a, a sagittal plane. Yeah. Now, even when we do bar work and strength training, it's, it's, it's generally sagittal plane, hence why I'm such a big advocate of strongman training. Well, this is the thing. When you yeah. do strongman training, and I've gotten into it now hiring uh, Aaron Scarborough from Iron Revolution, who's been awesome for me, and... 
the one thing that before, a couple of years ago, I would have been like, no, you don't want to load in flexure and extension. That's a compromised position. But then you realize the spine is very robust and adaptable and we're supposed to and we should load in flexion, which is when you pick up the stone and an extension is when you lift it. Exactly, yeah. And so yeah, that's, that's, that's one of you know, my major points is that we, you know, we should be preparing the, 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 the spine for the chaotic nature of like movement patterns, yeah, okay? And as I said, because we don't prepare the, the spine for rotational movements, you know, um, then you're more likely to, to, to actually get injuries when you do ask the spine to move in a rotational, um, in a rotational plane, yeah, okay? Um, and once again, if I try to get people to do more articulation through the thoracic and, and, and the cervical, they just don't have the capacity to do it because they've never really got the, the facet joint the facet joints moving in those particular planes like you look at the cervical and it, you know it's on an axis okay so which means it loves transverse movement but once again if i ask people to do that transverse movement they'd only really feel comfortable doing more sagittal plane for the cervical yeah okay and actually you look at it what's the next most common inj injury for slip disc and and issues with the intervertebral disc and so forth well it's flexion Okay, now once again, because people aren't really strengthening their spine in flexion, yep. okay, then it's extension, okay? Now, because, you know, once again, I've got nothing against a neutral spine and when I'm dealing with beginners and so forth, then I'll get them 100% to lift in a neutral spine because my major goal here is just to, as I said, to create mass and strength in the muscle surface area and so forth. So down the line, we can work and we can recruit more motor unit pulls within that surface area to help with things like uh, explosiveness and speed. Like I, I just want to create a base strength first, yeah, okay? But then at some point, we're going to have to create some strength in more complex movements through the spine, okay? And as I said, if, you, if, you, if your, goal, your goal is athletic performance and sport and you're not strengthening in rotation, you're not strengthening in flexion, the likelihood is you're, you're probably going to get injured yeah okay and the same thing is if you're not preparing like the ankles and the and and the knee joint well you look at the ankle joint you know the telecarule joint well the telecarule joint is not meant to be an explosive joint it's not meant to be a powerful joint despite what people think okay it's meant to have an incredible range of movement yeah, okay and that range of movement yeah okay um, because if you don't have that that range of movement, then that has a knock-on effect to other areas further up the body. Yep. Yeah, okay. And a lot of the time with the ankle joint, it's once again it's got a lot of scar tissue, adhesions. Yeah, okay. Calcification, all these things. Now, how can I break up the scar tissue and the adhesions? Well, more complex movement. Yeah, okay. So you know, um, and but once again, most of the time we're just working in these sort of linear sagittal planes yeah okay and that's why i'm really big on things like you know like primal movements and animal flow and so forth because you start to get the telecarule joint working in all these different um you know at all these different angles to help to break up that calcification which ultimately is going to help with what well when we actually want to get like more depth on a squat because the what the ankle joint allows you to do, do what the telecarule joint allows you to do is it's the key to helping you get more depth on a squat. It's a, it's, it's a huge limitation for why people can't get asked to grass on a squat. Okay. Um, now, without breaking up that or that calcification and so forth, that's going to be a, a hard task for a lot of people. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So, you know, because a lot of people really struggle with like dorsiflexion. And when you've got bad dorsiflexion, well, good luck trying to squat for depth. Okay. So, that's one thing that like Ido really, you know, and even when he talked about, you know, the, the, the glenohumeral joint or well, the glenohumeral joint, you know, it's ball and socket joint. Okay. And it only 25% sits in the socket. Yeah. yeah the okay. humerus. Uh, you're yeah, yeah, to. yeah. Yeah. And so if it only 25% sits in the socket, okay, well, it tells me it's born for complexity. Okay, but once again, we just tend to do a lot of open kinetic chain, like we might do things like bicep curls and, and I'm not taking away from these things because we need to create, once again, mass and strength. That's the, that's the seed, that's the platform, okay? But also it's built for that complexity and also we need to do a lot more closed kinetic chain to actually help with the rotator cuff muscles because that actually really helps with the strength of the stabilizing muscles. Yeah. Now, the glenohumeral joint, a little bit different to the, to the, to the hips, yeah, okay? 
is really dependent on the rotator cuff muscle group yeah okay and once again if we're not doing like closed kinetic chain like handstands and so forth you know even push-ups and most people can't even do a push-up properly yeah okay if we're not doing you know like straight arm strength maybe like ring work yep. l sits planches all these types of things well we're not really asking the the rotator cuff muscles to stabilize and help to to stabilize the shoulder girdle yeah okay and so once again, like, you know, my point being, what Ido was saying is that we need to try and, you know, um, work a little bit more complexity through the gluteno-humeral joint, okay? And we can't just continually just do uh, all these, you know, open kinetic chain. Now, I'm not saying open kinetic chain is bad. You're saying both. Yeah. We've got to add both. Exactly. We need both. Yeah, okay. And But most of the time, especially in performance and that, okay, um, because it helps with things like force development and that make that makes sense and it carries carry carries over to a lot of athletic performance realms and so forth but then we just put all the focus on that and because we're not working the closed kinetic chain stuff we're not really helping with the shoulder girdle we're not really helping with the you know the rotator cuff muscles like the infraspinatus and the supraspinatus subscapularis and then these these things it ends up with ratio issues just like you get ratios, ratio issues with your, your biochemistry and your yeah. microbiome yeah. and so forth. Well, you get ratio issues with your biomechanics and your, and your muscle fibers and so forth. And then all of a sudden when you've got these ratio issues to what you can push to where your rotator cuff muscle strength is, then all of a sudden you start to get injuries. Okay. Um, and so that's one thing that, you know, Ido really drilled into me, yeah, okay, is that... Yes, we, you need to have a base and you need to have a framework, okay? But then don't just keep on working on the same stuff, yeah, okay? Like ultimately, you've got to progress, yeah, okay? And you, you, you've got to work on a little bit more complexity and stuff that really carries over into more a cha chaotic nature. And a chaotic nature would be what we see in sport. You don't talk okay. about this a lot, and it's great to hear you talk about it because I think it reminds people that, you know, this is your bread and butter and where you started from, yeah, right? Yeah, this is, this is definitely where I started from, yeah, okay? Um, Keep talking. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, it's definitely where I started from, and, like, it's, it's you know, the, an area that I'm very passionate about. I mean, maybe maybe one of the, the, the major reasons that I end up getting into a lot of the other realms as well is... So, so basically, I could support that a lot better. Yeah, because you know, what we're doing, and you, you call it a monotherapy, what we end up doing is as strength coaches and, and physiotherapists or whatever, allied health professionals, we, we look at the one component to health, right? Strength training, or, ju or just a nutritionist. But you, you are the guy who realizes and r make people like me realize that, well, hold on, this is a human being. It's a machine consisted of multiple, multiple body systems. And we, to optimize all of them, we need to take in consideration every component to fully optimize the human body. And to me, I call that a holistic health practitioner. I mean, I think that's what you are and I'm aspiring to be. Um, I don't know my point of bringing it up now anymore and what the hell we're talking about. <laughs> yeah, well, look, look, I understand where you're going, where, where you're going and it's, it's one thing that I'm really trying to get across to strength and conditioning coaches, performance coaches, but just, you know, personal trainers is that it's, there, there's this sort of approach that like, sort of stay in your lane, yeah? Um, what do you and, think about that? Yeah, and look, I understand where people are coming from, okay, but when you're dealing with the human body, okay, and you're not actually understanding the ramifications of when people have digestive complications. You're not understanding the ramifications of when there's hormonal imbalance and neurotrans. Now, I'm not saying, I'm not asking personal trainers and strength and conditioning coaches to go heal people from particular diseases, yeah, okay? But there's, there's an aspect where I was confronted with a, with a question once where someone says, well, it's negligence yeah okay for a personal trainer to start to tap into these realms i don't 100 percent agree and the reason i don't 100 percent agree is it's ne it, yes there's negligence there if they start tapping into that realms and then they start using specialized herbs and so forth to try and rectify their clients problems okay but if they're understanding that realms and that allows them to understand what training mechanisms are going to work better for that individual that's what I'm really trying to set out for personal trainers and strength and conditioning 
coaches to understand because you can read things like blood markers and you can understand people's like gastrointestinal problems and that allows you to understand what type of training regimes are going to be better for them the question i need to ask people is what's greater negligence when you're dealing with the human body yeah okay is there a greater negligence to completely ignore those factors yeah okay and then just give whatever you're yeah. whatever you're taught at university yeah. or whatever you're taught by your mentors and so forth and just give them particular training regimes okay that ultimately because of the problems that they have could actually lead them even closer to disease mm -hmm. okay and actually cause more stress related issues cause more digestive complications is that negligence okay or is what other people were saying is negligence if i understand these these complications and that allows me to better periodize and 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 have better application of even exercise selection and better application of energy systems p through particular time frames which one is negligence okay that's that's the question that needs to be asked because for me the my answer is very simple if I'm going blindly into things and just recommending particular programs and training regimes just based on what I think should work, okay, and what I was taught through a particular framework, for me, when I'm dealing with someone who's got these serious health complications, that's negligence. Ignorance yeah, is not yeah, bliss yeah. in this situation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think yeah. That, that's, that's such a great point um, you just made. I think that answers it. Yeah. I mean, and that, and that's, and that's, the, you know, in a, in a lot of the stuff that I'm teaching trainers is not about trying to treat disease. It's not. It's it's like getting them to put more safeguard, you know, um, protocols in place that are really going to assist the individual. Yeah. Okay. Um, rather than just randomly, you know. You know picking something because they heard it was good yeah okay or using things like estrogen clearers just because that you know they want to try and have maybe a, a you know a better result from a body composition perspective with a particular individual without actually understanding the ramifications of what those estrogen clearers might be doing to that particular individual yeah okay randomly just using high dosages of amino acids based on someone told them that that was a good thing to do yeah okay like and i'm not i'm not you know i'm not dismissing the benefits of amino acids but i'm just saying it's the principle it, of blindly it, applying it, things yeah but blindly applying things just based on you know social media or what someone else told you down the streets or you know like like what i'm saying is that once you start to understand really how that individual is functioning and really what's going on with them internally with their biochemistry their microbiome it allows you to truly understand what safeguard measures you can put in place and more importantly what training regimes you can put in place that's not going to make that individual go backwards yeah, okay and and more importantly it's not going to uh you know massively negatively affect their their health even more Okay, then that's more important. And, you know, the, the misconception is that people think the, you know, the answers is always going to be like, you know, um, okay, if it's body composition and weight loss, well, it all comes down to calorie restriction and increased energy expenditure. Well, if it was that simple, why doesn't that work for a huge amount of people? Yeah, okay. And just to understand, like, and this, this is what I'm trying to tr teach strength and conditioning coaches and personal trainers that, there is huge ramifications. If you just drop someone's calories calories really low, you keep them in that realms for a long period of time and then you train them really hard. And the ramification is you've just led them to serious health issues that could actually long-term result in particular health conditions. Yeah, okay? And so what I mean by this, yeah, okay? Um, I'll just use a bit of an example. If I go like really low calories, then, then I do that for a long period of time because yes, there's benefits. I'm not taking away from the benefits of eating lower calories, yeah, okay? I don't want people to misconstrue what I'm saying, yeah, okay? Because it helps with insulin sensitivity and it helps with detoxification. It can help with the gut lining. I want to clarify that. But, um, and it can help with the adrenal glands, okay? So there, there's huge amounts of benefits to, to dropping your calories low. But I also want to, I want people to understand there's huge amount of benefits to increasing your calories as well because it actually helps with protein synthesis. That's what people tend to focus on. But the big advantage, it actually helps with your metabolism. It actually helps with your thyroid. 
your thyroid is dependent on calorie intake, not calorie de- like you know, not calorie uh, depletion. Yeah, okay. And then your sex hormones. Okay, so your steroidal hormones like testosterone and estrogen and progesterone and cortisol, they're really dependent on calorie consumption as well. So there's benefits to under eating, but there's also benefits to eating more food. You need both. Yeah, okay. But the, the problem is a lot of the benefits that I was talking about with calorie, you know, restriction and calorie depletion, okay, if you do that for too long. Some of those benefits are no longer. What are the yeah, signs yeah. that you see? Signs and symptoms of like you're you're doing this too long, and you need to do some reverse dieting. Like, what do you what what's practically people can see and analyze within themselves that it's too long or too well, much? Well, yeah. Well, one one thing that I was going to get across, yeah, okay, is that basically you you know without getting too much into the weeds, yeah, okay, but basically you've got your HPT axis, which is your hypothalamus hypothalamus your pituitary and your, and your thyroid yeah, okay and obviously you've got the hpa access hypothalamus pituitary and then the adrenal glands okay now i'm not saying like in moment and time yeah okay stress response is a high priority of the body now why is the stress response a high priority of the body because if you don't deal with the stress response the end result or the perception of the body is that could end up in death strangely enough the body is going to prize prioritize death over other things like your thermostat and thermogenesis and your metabolism i'm not saying those things aren't important but you understand it's going to prioritize the hpa access because it's to do with stress response which means if you've got the hpa ax- hpa access you've got the hpt access a lot of the time the thyroid gets caught up in the madness does that make sense yeah okay and so sometimes if you have negative feedback loops okay uh, to the brain to the hypothalamus when you're just producing too many catecholamines like adrenaline noradrenaline and and too many stress hormones like cortisol but also too much like corticotropian releasing hormone and so forth you have this negative feedback loop to the brain that basically stop says stop producing all these stress hormones does that make sense it's trying to help you okay and in the process guess what they can actually down regulate other hormones as well that makes sense because they're they're within the same parameters does that make sense okay and then you've got thyrotropian releasing hormone yeah okay it's a messenger and that's actually the 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 first thyroid hormone but i want to make it clear that's not necessarily where thyroid uh, hormones essentially come from because you need the building blocks you need tyrosine you need iodine a lot of that's going to come down to your ability to absorb and uptake mm-hmm. those things in the gastrointestinal line because people go, oh, that's where it comes from. Mm, need the building blocks first. Yeah, okay. But thyrotropin releasing hormone basically uh, sends a message to the anterior pituitary gland, okay, where essentially you produce TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone. Most people have heard of that. And it's an iodine trapper, yeah, okay. But it's also a messenger hormone and it sends a message to the thyroid to produce thyroxine and a T4. I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to go further than that, but the reason I wanted to talk about the, the, the first two is because they actually help with the gastrointestinal lining. This is quite interesting, yeah, okay? Because they actually help with an area called the mucosa. Within the mucosa, you've got the lamina propria, okay? Within that lamina propria. So we're talking about connective tissue here. So this, all, even all this sort of stuff can relate to what I was talking about with performance and movement and so forth, yeah, okay? Um, and so this, this connective tissue, within that you have a thing called GALT, which is called gut-associated lymphoid tissue. Now within there, you produce B cells. So this is- What immune, are B cells? B cells, it's, they're, they're a type of uh, lymphocyte, okay? And so the role of B cells, they're to do with antigen response. So antigen is like immune response, okay? And so basically, B cells trigger M cells, they go to the surface of the lumen and they go, what is that? And so that could be a carbohydrate molecule, an amine or amino acid, okay? But it's like an identification process, yeah, okay? Uh, um, and the, the point that I want to get across here is if these are down-regulated... Because of the yeah, deficit. Because it, of the deficit, yeah. Yeah, okay? So if they're down-regulated, then that's in turn has a negative effect on your mucosa and has a negative effect in turn on what? your immune response, your antigen response, yeah, okay? And so I don't have a problem with the deficit, does that make sense? But I have a problem when people are going into a deficit for extremely long periods of time, and they've been doing that, because I'm sure you understand, Alex, yeah, okay, is that a lot of people have been sitting in a deficit for an extreme long period of time, and then just up their energy expenditure, okay, for also for a long period of time. And, and then so the issues that are occurring in the thyroid in turn cause complications yeah. 
in the in the in the digestive system and that starts to also compromise your antigen and your immune response and if that's compromising your immune response then that leaves the opportunity for pathogens and microorganisms and opportunistic bacteria to take advantage of that so the problem here is that the issues that were occurring in the down regulation of your thyroid hormones because of the stress that you were putting your body under from huge calorie deficit and so forth has in turn caused the gastrointestinal problem, okay? And then this, this is the vicious loop. Now, because I've got like gastrointestinal problem, well, the further conversion of thyroid hormones, yeah, okay, well, 20% of the conversion of T4 to T3, which is your more bioavailable thyroid hormone that helps with hydrochloric acid, um, pepsin, okay? So this is all ability to, uh, you know, synthesize and metabolize and break down protein, okay? Also helps with neurotransmitter balance, blood sugar management. Well, 20% of that conversion of T4 to T3 takes place in your gastrointestinal tract. Mm. So then you start to create even more issues with the thyroid. So now the gastrointestinal problems create more issues with the thyroid. So you see how people can have like a thyroid issue that's been caused by these huge calorie deficits that, that create a gut issue. Now they're letting, and so then they could go back to rectifying what's going on with the thyroid and the HPA access or whatever that might be. But now they're left with a gastrointestinal problem. And then the gastrointestinal problem is causing issues with the thyroid. And so this is, this is, this is, this is, this it's is a the, bad feedback loop. Yeah, it's a, it's a bad feedback loop. Yeah. Okay. And so what happens is then people might start to maybe become a little bit more understanding that they need to reverse diet and all this. Can you things. explain that um, reverse dieting and when is the right time to do it? Yeah, I'll, I'll definitely get into that. Yeah, okay, but what... The, you want to finish your thoughts? Yeah, I want to... Okay, but you know, the, the, the big thing that happens here is they might do the, the, the what is the right thing and reverse diet and slowly titrate their yeah. calories up and yep. do it the right way yeah okay um and obviously that that can de definitely be a different process from a female to to a to a male okay unfortunately like any of the listeners if they want to understand when it comes to battle of the sexes of who can under eat and drop their calories really low and do things like intermittent fasting on yes. a regular men win Okay, it's a, it's a bit of pill for women to, to to swallow because they have a perception that they do better on low calories, and, and it's just not it's just not true. The complexity of the hormones, okay, it's not great for them to be doing a lot of intermittent fasting. Yeah, um, yeah. So they could be doing the right things, and they and they and they reverse diet and so forth. But now the problem is they've got a digestive complication. Okay, and just to understand the reverse dieting is not going to fix the digestive complications that may have arose from the complications. But it may address the thyroid dysregulations and hormone it, dysregulations. Of course, yeah, okay. So it definitely can help with the, the thyroid dysregulation and the, and the, the downregulated metabolism and yep, help yep, yep. with, you know, um, like hunger hormones and fat storing hormones like ghrelin and so forth so i'm not taking away from that but you're saying you've done damage here and now you've it needs done to be repaired. yeah you've done damage here but just you know eating clean food and increasing your calories is not going to finish the uh, uh, fix the actual damage that has actually occurred in the gastrointestinal tract does it does that make sense so that so ultimately then they're doing those things and then they go look i'm still not getting results okay and so you can understand the individual's frustration because they thought oh well if i did this everything's going to be okay but it's actually the the gastrointestinal problems that are leading to a lot of their um issues with fat storing or what, whatever those other complications might be yeah okay does that make sense so getting back to your question to to ask with like reverse yeah. dieting yeah okay well if we just look at it in the most simple uh simple terms yeah okay well, with the, with the with the thyroid, it's, it's quite interesting. A, a research paper I read a long time ago. Okay, it was actually done by Harvard Medical University, and they actually did it on a group of men. Okay, um, and the base metabolic rate, which for me is quite prehistoric, the calculations that we use for base metabolic rate. So obviously we use formulas like Catch Mercado and so forth. But what I want people to understand is. Because even like I hear people say all the time, Alex, is that they basically say, well, you know, back in the day, well, we, we, we used to go days without eating. Yeah, who cares? Yeah, like like what we, don't, we don't live like hunter-gatherers anymore. Okay, you just need to understand, are we using our brain more than we used our brain, let's say, 500, 500 600 years ago? Yes, okay. Like, and 
like some people might have used their brain an extraordinarily large amount of times okay but majority of us are using our brain more than ever before okay because we're doing lots of research we're doing study okay most people might be doing multiple courses okay they're they're working a job that's a 10 hour day they're raising a family okay it puts a lot of stress on the brain i'm going to interrupt you because there was this study on chess players and they recorded how much energy expenditure they had and we're talking competitive chess players burning five to six thousand calories a day i use i use that research quite often oh you've seen that too Yeah, yeah yeah it just blew my mind i'm like hold on we're not accounting for so much energy expenditure. Exactly. And so that's why a lot of these formulas for base metabolic rate are quite broken. And I'm going to throw another spanner in the works a little bit later. That's yeah, what okay. you do. All right. But, the, you know, people are using these prehistoric formulas and they might be using, you know, the, the formula of Michelle Bridges and, you know, saying that the... Basically, it's you know thirteen hundred calories for females and eighteen hundred calories. You can't put for, blanket statements. Yeah, exactly. And it, you know we metabolize. The, the fact of the matter is we metabolize nutrients differently. When you've got gastrointestinal issues, that completely changes the formula. Your brain is the greedy organ. It, yes. d- it, it demands a hundred grams of glucose. That doesn't. And I don't want the listeners to think that that means you go out and get a whole heap of jelly beans and jelly babies. It doesn't need direct no. glucose. Your body can make it. it. Okay, it can use ketones. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So. But it, it does. It is. It is a greedy organ. Yeah. Okay. It does demand a lot of amino acids. You know things like serine. It demands a lot of, you know, uh, electrolytes. Yeah. Okay. It needs things like chloride and sodium and calcium. Yeah. Okay. So, it the the more I'm using my brain, the more nutrients I need. And you've just quoted an amazing research. It's basically said these guys sitting down in a chair, moving a couple of pieces Crazy. now and then, they're using these extraordinarily large amounts of calories. Why aren't we using these formulas? Okay, we have to put put these things into place. We're not doing that with people, which means a lot of the time people are sitting in these massive calorie deficits that is really negatively affecting things that I've already talked about and negatively affecting things like their neurotransmitters and their hormones and so forth. Yeah, okay, so... So, so that's one aspect. They basically say on a moderately stressful day that your brain will consume about 750 calories, okay? Which basically for most people is two meals, okay? Now, if you're only eating two meals, yeah, okay, well, this is, gonna, this is gonna pose, a, you know, a huge, a, a huge whole array of complications, okay? And the other thing is stress, okay? Now, if I just use a few examples here, they actually, because a lot of my, you know, uh, research around this actually is based on, athletes yeah okay it's actually based on sports science they actually tested elite athletes and they notice that elite elite athletes after a really hard training session would massively deplete uh, cholesterol stores that makes sense okay now why because cholesterol is a precursor to every single steroid or hormone now am i going to produce more things like testosterone i'm going to produce more things like dhea androstenedol androstenedone these androgen hormones am i going to produce more cortisol of course and we want to, yeah, okay? Now, does that mean that's going to deplete my stores of cholesterol? So what I'm synthesizing from the liver, but also what the demand you need from dietary cholesterol. Because it's 70-30, it's not all from the liver. Does that make sense? So it does mean I need some dietary cholesterol. So that's interesting. Can we clarify? 70-30, you mean 70% made endogenously, 30% needed from dietary sources. Correct. Yeah, okay. And so that can pose some problems because people have problems, you know, within the the liver. I don't want to get too much into that realm. Yeah, okay. But also they just have problems, you know, metabolizing and assimilating and breaking down lipids properly. Yeah, okay. So sometimes they might not get enough dietary cholesterol because of the complications going on in the epithelium and the mucosal cells and their ability to emulsify and break down fats. Yeah, okay. So it's it's really interesting that yes, that you know, like hard training sessions excessively depleted cholesterol. That's just one factor. Yeah, okay. The other factor is they they they, they looked at serum magnesium levels. So we're we're talking about plasma, which is, you know, I, I think I've yeah, which much. I've said to you is like it's not a great depiction of really where my magnesium levels are sitting, considering forty nine percent of magnesium was in the cell. We need it for energy. Yeah, okay. It may give us some depiction. It's just not a great one. We're talking about 0.5%. Okay. Now, red cell is better, but I'd still say it's only 2%. Not much better. Is it really 2%? Yeah, yeah. I thought red blood cell was it. Like yeah, that was. It's better, because it, but it's still only 2% depiction. So yeah, what's okay. the gold standard? It, the problem is, it's just like to look at, you need to look at a combination. Okay. Maybe we can t- touch on blood markers a little bit more, but it's, yeah. it's, it's generally... I want to look at what's going on with things like my blood sugar because magnesium is so important for the insulin receptor. Okay, it actually helps with tyrosine kinase, which is the insulin receptor. So it actually helps with insulin sensitivity. Mm. 
most of the time you've got to use a combination of many markers. Yeah, okay, so yes, I could use serum magnesium. Yes, I could re use red cell. Yes, I could use, you know, fasting glucose and fasting insulin because that's going to tell me what, what's going on from an insulin sensitivity perspective. Because when we talk about insulin sensitivity, one of the most important, you know, uh, compounds and nutrients that we can use is magnesium. And most people are talking about, you know, specialized things like, like chromium, chromium is important. I'm not taking away from that, like berberine and all these things. You know, berberine, that might help to shuttle the glucose into the cell for energy. But I'm just saying, well, magnesium is, 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 is super important because you need it for the tyrosine kinase. But then I can look at sodium levels as well because you've got the sodium magnesium pump and at the sodium levels we're talking about electrical systems here and the sodium levels a little bit high and then the magnesium is low well you know you've got a problem with the sodium magnesium pump and then basically when when there's an issue there and an imbalance whether the sodium is too high the magnesium is low then basically you're struggling to get enough magnesium into the cell that's a depiction of that okay and if i'm struggling to get enough magnesium in the cell that actually affects the tyrosine kinase so it affects the insulin receptor and you start to get these you know insulin resistance and blood sugar management dysregulation so i use a combination of all of those to really understand where okay. someone's magnesium levels but most of the time you understand they're not going to do that uh in the medical realms and they're most likely not going to do that in the in the sports science realms either unfortunately okay so they actually did testing on athletes and they actually noticed that one hard training session would deplete your serum magnesium levels tenfold. It's huge. It's huge, yeah. Okay. And how many people are taking magnesium and good quality magnesium, more bioavailable magnesium after they train? Like okay, a, I'm going to... What's... Uh, yeah. What you, you recommended me a huge, great brand, Fusion Health, which is a combination of multiple different types of magnesium. Is that your go-to gold standard? It, it, it is, and it, most of the time it depends on the problem, okay? And the reason that I like the, the Fusion Magnesium, not because I'm saying it is the best magnesium, but it, it is more bioavailable, which means it's uptake in the digestive system compared to a lot of other magnesiums uh, just tends to be better okay but i'm not taking away from a lot of the other, other magnesiums and for sure. some other people i may, may use other forms of magnesium yeah okay so people who've got like dhea issues I, I tend to use a magnesium sulfate and a magnesium sulfate which is really good in like a topical cream or like a, a topical magnesium magnesium sulfate is very good for people with mthfr gene defects you know once again i base it on what's really going on with the individual you know if people have like really low b12 they've got things like gaba issues gamma amino butyric acids so their brain's going like 100 miles an hour i'd use a magnesium taurate so it's magnesium bound to taurine yeah okay and because taurine is a precursor to gaba okay now also the the reason that i that i would also use the magnesium taurate in that instance okay because if the b12 levels are low they've actually shown that b12 actually helps with the synthesis of taurine okay now if b12 is low and it helps with the synthesis of taurine well that's generally correlates with low taurine levels okay and then taurine then i need it for gaba but it also taurine helps with reducing like inflammation in the body okay so you're missing out a lot of the benefits there so there that's why I would, I would go for more of a magnesium taurate okay um and people who've got like neurotransmitter imbalances and it can be a little bit better for uh, females like a magnesium three and eight okay if it's more neurological and it's mood disorders and so forth so i'm not saying a magnesium glycinate which is the predominant one in the in the fusion magnesium yeah. is the best but if we're talking about you know poor liver detoxification detoxification issues and you understand that the gastrointestinal tract 25 percent of detoxification takes place in the gut okay so the gut detoxification starts in the gut and it finishes in the gut the liver's the middleman really want people to understand that because we tend to put a lot of emphasis on the liver the liver is a workhorse yeah okay um, a lot of those issues really do tend to be more within the, the gastrointestinal lining yeah okay um so yeah so you know uh, it really depends on the individual in terms of the form of the for magnesium sure. that i'm going to give them but with people with gastrointestinal problems just for bioavailability if people have got like short chain fatty acid issues which is a huge amount of people then yes a magnesium glycinate is something that i would probably use what supplements are you taking right now are you, are you comfortable if you're not comfortable disclosing it yeah okay. I'll, I'll definitely talk like about going, that but i was curious yeah one one thing i just i just want to finish this whole thing with the base metabolic 
sort of yes. right yeah yes. <laughs> yes that's where we were yeah but you know so it's interesting where they're noticing these massive depletions through hard training sessions or things like magnesium and cholesterol and so forth so one of my, one of my points when it comes to base metabolic rate is that if you're highly stressed you, you know you're training really hard then and you and you're using something like a catch mercado or some of these more prehistoric formulas for calculating your base metabolic rate most likely you've ca- calculated your base metabolic rate incorrectly mm. okay um and you know people always want to ask me like what's the formula for for me doing a lot better on low calories and i well actually the formula is stress management the more you can manage your stress then you you're going to tend to do better on lower calories yeah okay um and when you're on lower calories i would actually advocate more for people to to not go through excessive training regimes and so forth like just move yeah okay and maybe it's actually more working at lower percentages yeah okay not pushing the body so hard and just blood flow and circulation yeah, okay um and you know a more stress management um aspects like heart math and meditation because those things will protect your nutrient reserves so you're not taking so many you're not taking amino acids from your amino acid pools or your nitrogen pools and you're not taking from the reserves of zinc and b vitamins so and then you're not putting as much stress on your body does that make sense yeah okay and so you know also when it comes to your base metabolic rate is that the the gastrointestinal lining will completely change that as well yeah okay so if i've got something like and i'll just use an example like intestinal permeability then my ability to absorb and assimilate macronutrients and micronutrients is compromised okay and so what people basically said well okay well if you're not breaking things down properly then you probably need to eat less which initially i thought okay so I, I can understand the principle in that in terms of because you're not stressing out the digestive system as much and you're not asking it to digest and process as much food but the problem is even with the the small quantity of food it's still not assimilating and breaking it down properly which essentially means you're getting less macronutrients and less micronutrients creating more deficiencies in the body more hormonal issues more neurotransmitter issues okay and so what i actually do find with people with intestinal permeability and there's so many different types of intestinal permeability there's that's a complex beast in itself okay but your base metabolic rate is actually going to increase the amount of nutrients and micronutrients that you need is actually higher and how many people in a western society do you think have complications like intestinal permeability i I can tell you from looking at bloods on a regular basis it's 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 the higher majority of western population the higher majority of Western population, like I, I just got to a point where I could just look at bloods and I just, you know, they, they've got some form of intestinal permeability taking place. What's a marker that you, markers that you, I know you do correlations and yeah. like, what are some you see? Yeah, so look, look, you know, if people are looking at like their immune markers and a lot of the pro-inflammatory white blood cells. So like high white blood cell count? Yeah, so, but it can also tell you really where the state of the gut lining is. So for instance, if the, the monocytes and the eosinophils and the basophils, the combined total of that is on the high side. Okay, I'm not necessarily going to give people away totals and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, okay. Um, you know, obviously, I you know I, I teach people about this stuff, or and that's what I prefer to do. Is like people have got a real interest in this, come and come and see me, come and come and learn it because it is exceptionally fascinating. Yeah, okay, and complex, and and the results that I'm seeing with people are phenomenal. Yeah, okay, um, and the MEBs in this instance, yeah, okay, they would be on the high side. Okay, and when they're on the high side, it's actually ta- telling me that hyperpermeability is taking place and that could be the small intestine large intestine and you know just so people understand you can have a lot of paracellular activity or hyperpermeability taking place in the epithelium in the lungs as well it's actually one of the complications that really uh, you know arises with like viruses and you know we, we could bring up the, the coronavirus but i think people would probably you know heard enough about that yeah okay but basically this hyperpermeability means you know with the cells in let's just use the small intestine as an example here the major type of epithelium or mucosal cells in the small intestine is the enterocytes okay and those enterocytes are sort of you know uh, positioned nice and tight you know against each other okay that actually allows those cells to communicate 
communicate with each other, okay? And as they're communicating with each other, I want I want people to look at it a bit like, uh, you know, how they say like redwood forests and the and all the roots meet, so it's one big living organism or a coral reef. And it's the same thing with your gastrointestinal lining, okay? And so those intracellular tight junctions, which are the gaps sort of in between the cells, okay? They're meant to most of the time be nice and pushed up, nice and tight against each other. And the role of the gastrointestinal lining is to either make things impermeable, so not allow them through, yeah, okay? Or to make them more permeable, to actually allow them to come through, yeah, okay? And so actually what happens with um, too much paracellular activity uh, or hyperpermeability is that basically the tight junctions, so all these different sections, it's a complex thing. There's all these different sections of this intracellular tight junction, okay? The top section is the tight junction. Now, most people might know in terms of um, what affects the tight junction is gliadin or gluten, yeah, okay? And that's whether you're celiac, non-celiac. I wanna clear that up, yeah, okay? And so people go, oh, you know, I've had the transglutaminase IgA test and I don't have gluten sensitivity. It doesn't I go, matter, right? Well, it's one test, okay? There's, there's actually six tests that you can actually have to see if you're having problems with the re- wheat fractions in wheat. Won't get into all the complexity of that, but just to understand, there was a there's a scientist called S. Drago. Yes, who, please who, talk about this. Yeah, the scientist, 2005, S. Drago, and he wasn't trying to demonize wheat. Like, I just want to make that clear, yeah, okay? He was just trying to see what reaction took place in the gastrointestinal lining when you consume gluten. And he and did it. He had a group that was celi- uh, celiac, right? And okay. one that was non-celiac? Yep, yep, and exactly. And he was just, he just wanted to see, okay, what reaction takes place? Yeah. And whether you're celiac, non-celiac, there's the same reaction, yeah. okay? And he basically says what, what happens is the gliadin molecule stimulates a particular protein and that you've got these... These tight junctions are made up of like 50 different tight junction proteins. It's complex, okay? Right at the top of the tight junction is the gatekeeper, okay? If we want to call it zonulin, yeah, okay? And then you've got other ones like uh, occludin, oseludin, cloudine, yeah, okay? And then they're more like uh, filter proteins. So they're basically going to dictate what goes through, what doesn't, yeah, okay? Um, and then zonulin, basically, gliadin stimulates, and gliadin's the, 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 the problematic um, protein molecule within gluten, yep. okay, that basically it stimulates zonulin and tells zonulin to open the tight junctions. Okay, so you've got the tight junctions, then you've got adherent tight junctions, which is another section of that intracellular tight junction. You've got desmosomes, then you've got gap junctions. I'm not going to talk about every single every single aspect, okay? And then the, the gap junctions, okay, that's where the cell pushes tight against each other. And that allows this cell to communicate with this cell, okay? It's got like little nerves running through it, like nerve endings. And that is obviously part of the ability of the cells to communicate with each other. Now, with the gliadin molecule, which unfortunately in a lot of Western food and so forth, it's been genetically modified to contain higher concentrations yes. of the gliadin molecule. I'm actually like, you know, I used to be so anti-gliadin, so anti-gluten, yeah, okay? And I am, I, I think it's a huge problem in countries like Australia and America and so forth. But in, in countries where the gliadin concentration is very low, I don't have such a big problem with this, yeah, okay? Where they're getting it from triticum durum wheat, where good quality sourdough, um, you know, rye bread as it's meant to be made. But the gliadin concentration in these things is very low, which means you're not getting bombarded with as much of this protein molecule, which means you're not really widening that tight junction as often. Does that make sense? Now, how it's meant to work is in a healthy your gastrointestinal lining is minerals will go up the intracellular tight junctions. And one of those key minerals is calcium. Most people are going to think of calcium helping with things like bone density and so forth. But one of the really important things about calcium is it actually is the zipper of the intracellular tight junction. So it goes up the tight junction and it tells Zolan to pull that tight junction tight again and so basically all S. Drago was saying is this reaction caused by the gliadin molecule which is a normal protein molecule in food food is normal he just says that that happens and in a healthy gut environment the calcium will go up and it'll pull it tight again we're all sweet okay but the problem is is if I've got if I'm consuming you know the genetically modified you know, wheat that we uh, that we eat in countries like in Australia and America and so forth, the gliadin concentration is higher. That's going to pose some problems because that's happening more frequently. And the other thing that's within the wheat that we consume is glyphosate. Mm. Okay, and so glyphosate, which is weed killer for the listeners, yeah, okay. Well, glyphosate is water soluble, which means nothing's a barrier. 
Yeah, okay. And so basically, if the the tight junctions open up and the glyphosate goes down the intracellular tight junctions, okay, it damages the gap junctions. Now, if it gam- if it damages the gap junctions, so what what's actually happening is I'm damaging the communication now between this cell and this cell. It's like those cells are acting independently. Now, going to that hyperpermeability scenario, I've created more hyperpermeability through the intracellular tight junction, which means certain enzymes and protein molecules and fluids and so forth that would normally get filtered at a particular rate and so forth. They're just getting through there. Into the bloodstream. Yeah, well, basically into the hepatic portal system, which basically means bloodstream liver. Yeah, okay. And so some of these molecules, you know, like for example, like lectins that you get out of things like nightshades. And I don't want to demonize lectins. I'm just using them as an example because they're a trigger mechanism. Yeah, okay. And so basically they're part of the plant's immune system. So completely normal. And I'm not anti-lectins. So things like legumes and beans and lentils and as I said, nightshades, they've got a lot of properties exceptionally good for you. And lectins shouldn't be a problem in a healthy gut environment. Okay. But healthy gut environments aren't common anymore. Exactly. Okay. And so then people go, well, you know, I react to the lectin, so they mustn't be good for me. Ah, well, they're, they're, they're fine for you. You just don't have a healthy gut lining. That's where the real issues lie. Yeah. Okay. And so in a healthy gut environment, those things wouldn't be causing a problem. Okay. And so what actually happens is that the lectins, they're glycosides. Okay. And so in a healthy gut environment, they go through the intracellular tight junctions unchanged. That's in a healthy gut environment. So imagine where I've got more hyperpermeability. Well, they're getting through there at a rapid rate, which just basically creates a higher amount of antibody or immune response. Yes. It ramps it up. Yeah. Okay. And they're being glycosides. Glycosides basically means the protein molecule binds with glucose molecules and it forms a glycoprotein basically polypeptide molecule and a carbohydrate molecule it's a transporter molecule and the problem with like creating more glycoproteins and you create biochemical chaos in the body and so when people are consuming these things like the nightshades and the lectins and the legumes and they it, it makes them feel out of it yeah, okay, but the real problem here is what's going on with the hyperpermeability in the gastrointestinal lining. Not to blame the legumes and the beans and the and the lentils. Does that make they're sense? They're just the triggers. Yeah. They're just they're just a trigger. Yeah, okay. And so, the the you know if I was looking at blood markers and those MEBs were you know really elevated. What's MEB stand for? So the monocytes, the eosinophils, and oh, the basophils, which okay. are the pro-inflammatory sort of white blood cells. Got yeah, it. okay. Then that's telling me along with other markers as well. I don't want to make that clear. Yeah, okay, I don't just use, you know, I, for me, it's all about the correlations. Yeah, okay. But that's telling me that there's excessive hyperpermeability. So things like inflammatory markers would be elevated. That's like an overactive immune system, like ESR, erythrocyte sedimentation rate. And that's telling me at the rate at which your red blood cells sediment within a given hour. Now, in this instance, when it's really high, it basically means the red blood cells are sticking and clumping together they form this thing called like rule a which is basically telling me inflammation yeah okay and so that would be really indicative of hyperpermeability mm. taking place does that make sense yeah okay um and so and then on the flip side okay so the hyperpermeability could be going on for a long period of time yeah okay and then what can actually happen to the meb total over a long period of time is that your body cannot really mount an immune response anymore Okay, because like if you look at things like, you know, um, uh, immunoglobulins, which are protein molecules, because they're like your first line of defense. Yeah, okay. And a lot of these immunoglobulins are produced within the epithelium, the mucosal cells in your gut lining. Okay, but they're protein molecules. Your body can't just, it's not like an oompa loompa factory in there. It just can't just keep on producing this endless amount of protein molecules. And the same thing, you're going to have cellular activation, which means you're going to stimulate your white blood cells for good reason because you need to mount an immune response. But once again, you, your, your white blood cells, it's, it's not like David Blaine. It's not like a magic trick. They don't go, here, here we go, here's some more white blood cells. They all come from somewhere, correct? Yeah, okay. And so that's going to put a lot more pressure on stem cells. So that puts more pressure on vitamin A fat soluble vitamin yeah okay now it's going to put more pressure on things like your lymphocytes yeah okay what helps with the synthesis of lymphocytes and white blood cells vitamin c puts more pressure on vitamin c okay you know granulocytes like neutrophils and monocytes and eosinophils and basophils b9 folate yeah, okay um vitamin d sort of governs your entire you know immune system or your innate immune system okay because it when it's converted into its more active form which is 125 ohd 
which happens in the kidneys, allows you to produce antimicrobial peptides, okay, so protein molecules that help to fight off the bacteria. So you're not putting as much pressure on your white blood cells. But if I'm putting more pressure on the vitamin D and then I'm depleting my vitamin D stores, then that in turn puts more pressure on the, on the white blood cells. Does that make sense? And then you're putting more pressure on these micronutrients. And what's the, what's the, what's the added pressure taking place? is if I've got absorption and assimilation issues, I'm struggling to synthesize and absorb these micronutrients that I need for these processes. So basically what happens, you, what you'll see happen to the MEBs, and once again, I'm just using it as an example because I use other correlations, is the MEBs go the other way. So they actually crash, yeah, okay? And so I actually see that the MEBs would be on the low side. Really? Yeah, yeah, it's, and that's actually- a How does that not just confuse you? Because you're like, well, they're high, so it's a high inflammatory response. Then they crash. How do you distinguish? Because if, because if you're not looking at the correlations, you cannot make that. Oh, the, 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 it's uh, not by itself. Yeah. So, so for instance, like in this instance, okay. So yes, the MEBs, but if I look at them individually as well, so the eosinophils would generally be at zero. Okay, and so that's to do oh, with that low. Your, a lot of a lot of your eosinophils are actually produced within the gastrointestinal lining. Okay. Makes sense. Okay, why? Because it deals with IgE complications. Okay. Uh, which is uh, basically immunoglobulin, but it's, it deals with multicellular parasites. So it actually, and it's, it, it's, it's a, a, like a histamine response, okay? Now, once again, your body just can't keep on producing histamine forever, okay? And so you understand you've got the acute response, and when there's an acute response, you're going to produce more things like cortisol, more things like histamine, okay? But then... It's going to go the other way and you're going to produce low amounts of cortisol low amounts of histamine like histamine intolerance yeah okay um and then what's going to happen to your white blood cell count because you understand things like cortisol stimulates the lymphatic organs okay and it actually stimulates your immune response so it actually stimulates white blood cells and so forth if that's a good thing it's not a bad thing does that make sense but if, if i if i'm if i've got low cortisol levels and i'm not really stimulating my lymphatic organs and not stimulating my immune system then you you're going to have low white blood cell count you're going to have low things like eosinophils. so these people their mebs would be on the low side yeah okay and when they're really on the low side it's basically me telling me that severe intestinal permeability is taking mm. place the damage is getting so bad that wow. basically they've got things like histamine intolerance so they're not really capable of producing high amounts of histamine because histamine is like a little bit like a warning sign for you yeah okay? for those who don't know can you describe the role and function of histamine what it is uh yeah look i'll go into i'll, I'll definitely go into that realms um but just to finish up with you know what's going on with the with the with the gut lining but in this instance yeah okay if they've got something like histamine uh intolerance and producing low levels of histamine then they don't get histamine responses yeah, okay and so they don't get things like maybe watery eyes yeah okay or things like skin rashes or hives yeah okay to basically tell them what they're putting in their body is is having a negative reaction okay so how they tend to respond to things like food is they eat food and it just makes them feel exhausted and the one thing that you know i'll say to people you know, and i you know i heard tony robbins once who like a massive respect you know amazing yeah okay and he was just i think he was trying to just get across his point in terms of like positive energy and so so forth energizing the body and i 100 percent agree with him but he said like is food energizing and you know he basically said no you know a lot of people feel tired and so forth and so i would actually say but you're not meant to yeah yeah, okay, like, yes, a lot of people feel tired when they eat, but let's get one thing straight. You shouldn't feel tired when you eat. Food is energizing, food is energy. That, once again, that just actually comes down to how are you interacting with the food? And if it makes you feel exhausted and tired, how you're interacting with it is a problem. Does that make sense? And so the, the, the issue here is if I'm not able to mount a, like a histamine response or anything like that to tell me that I'm reacting to the food that I'm putting in my body, then you just no energy mm. okay and so if you look at once again i don't want to demonize histamine because people you know probably have this negative sort of mindset when it comes to histamine because antihistamines and how antihistamines work is they play on his histamine receptors yeah okay uh and histamine receptors are just protein molecules yeah okay histamine is a good thing yeah okay it's like it's like the alarm system in the body 
and and histamine and cortisol they sort of go hand in hand they go with each other yeah okay and if i'm basically stimulating stress hormones and cortisol then you're going to stimulate histamine as well yeah okay and the role of histamine as a hormone is it actually helps with things like gastric juices and it actually helps to make my gut more permeable now if i said that to people the alarm bells are going to go off and people go oh that's not a good thing i go oh it's necessary yeah okay and the reason that helps to make your gut more permeable is it can transport uh, things like platelets, like particular types of red blood cells, and they transport protein molecules like cytokines and neurotransmitters, okay? Um, and they also uh, will help to transport like phagocytes, like white blood cells, neutrophils and monocytes. This is a necessary immune risk so your body can mount an immune response. Does that make sense? Okay, so histamine is a good thing in this, in this instance, but histamine is also a neurotransmitter, yeah, okay? And as a neurotransmitter, it causes like hypoarousal in the brain, yeah, okay? Um, and it actually helps with aspects of like libido, okay? Um, so so th there's huge benefits to histamine, yeah, okay? But you've got all these different histamine receptors, yeah, okay? And these histamine receptors are throughout the body, yeah, okay? And you've got histamine receptors in your brain, obviously in your skin, in your gastrointestinal lining, in your lungs, yeah, okay? And so there's, you know, H1 receptors in the brain, yeah, okay? And it actually helps to regulate your sleep-wake cycle, okay? It's pretty important, yeah, okay? You've got H2 receptors, which you find on things like neutrophils. You've got H2 receptors in the paratel cells in the stomach lining. Um, you've got H3 receptors, more to do with the central nervous system, and those receptors help to nullify the, the, the symptoms and the negative effects of... Uh, of histamine responses and you got h4 receptors which is more to do with things like mast cells uh, which can be a good depiction of when you've got high mast cell activity in hyperpermeability and uh, intestinal permeability taking place so there's all these histamine receptors okay and so what i want people to understand is like histamines if we use this uh, like a, the smoke alarm analogy okay and so basically what's the role of a smoke alarm is to warn you if there's a fire mm -hmm. okay and that's a little bit like histamine it's like pre-warning you that there's something that's going in in the body okay and so you know maybe that's pathogens and bacteria okay or that your your body's reacting to the protein molecules or the fiber molecules that you're consuming in the food but it's there to warn you that something's going in the body that ultimately is mounting like an immune response so it's like the warning sign yeah okay Although it could be environmental as well it could be like like dust particles or whatever, like you know, um, you know, some sort of foreign antigen or foreign microorganism. Okay, it's just normal response. Does yeah. that make sense? Like histamine is a necessary process. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so if we if we go that smoke and a smoke alarm analogy. Okay. Well, you know, how have we tried to deal with when histamine is pre warning us that there's something essentially wrong going on in the body we just blunt it with well basically we take antihistamines yeah. okay and the the you your body has the mechanisms with within within the body to deal with excess amounts of histamine there's actually enzymes and one of them is called dao diamine oxidase okay and some really important building blocks for diamine oxidase are certain you know vitamins like b12 yeah okay vitamin a has a sort of indirect one because it um, has a positive effect on reducing inflammation and you know uh, positive effect on uh, too many like uh, omega-6s like arachidonic acid yeah, okay so they can actually help with the diamine oxidase yeah, okay and the diamine oxidase is an enzyme that helps to get mitigate too much histamine activity so we we've got the mechanisms yeah. to deal with it the problem is when we expose ourselves to things like multimedia and that can be mris and you know like pharmalogica and you know things like antidepressants and nsads you know anti-inflammatories and panadols and painkillers that all these things deplete dao mm -hmm. so you actually dep deplete your body's natural ability to deal with the with the histamine and what's the problem then we're going to have to use antihistamines to try and blunt those those symptoms and the antihistamines themselves cause more issues with within the gastrointestinal lining and because what they're essentially doing if i use that smoke alarm analogy is it's like taking the batteries out of the smoke alarm okay you're taking because you, you, the symptoms are there for a reason to warn you okay and rather than actually dealing with and going okay so 
what problem do I have to fix with most likely within the gastrointestinal lining? I'll just avoid the problem and I'll just keep on doing what I'm doing. I'll take the antihistamine to nullify the symptoms. Okay, so basically I'll walk into the house and I'll take the batteries out of the smoke alarm. Okay, and then let's start a fire. Okay, and so you start a fire and you've got no warning of where the fire is. There's no and you and you and you 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 don't know where the where the smoke is coming from. Does that make sense? And in our right mind. Would you do that in your house? Okay, but that's essentially what you're doing in your body. Okay, is that you're nullifying the symptoms because basically histamine is just telling you that there's a problem that ultimately we have to fix in the body. Does that make sense? Okay, that's the analogy I like to use. So I don't want to, you know, I don't want to demonize histamine like histamines, you know, um, you know, the precursor is L-histidine. Okay, that does tend to be a big problem nowadays because you get that out of things like mother's milk and um, like colostrum. You know, yeah, yeah. Mother's milk is 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 really so we we get it our breast milk. We should be, but once again, if it's really dependent on the nutrients and so forth that the the mother is consuming to whether the the baby receives enough L-histidine, and L-histidine is the precursor to histamine, which is basically to do with your immune system. Yeah, okay. So. Um, Definitely gone on a few tangents here. That's, okay? what, that's <laughs> what we do. That's, but Dave, like that's the thing because this is complex and there's you, it's very evident that there's so many factors relating and interrelating. And I just want to highlight, even though it was a while ago, you pointed out a really great point about why gluten and gliden is problematic. Okay, And I just want to emphasize that the mechanism of how you explained it perfectly is there because people get confused about uh, what is gluten good is it bad well you explain the mechanism we don't even need to touch on anymore but just to for anybody listening it's like you've heard people think it's a fad like people you talk about it, people think it's a fad it's like well ah, gluten's fine it's whatever but they're eating all this processed refined it hasn't been fermented properly like a sourdough or rye so i just want to highlight that and then move on from that to something that i've never heard you talk about you you don't I don't think I don't hear you talk about much about yourself, right, Dave O'Brien? Like the practice. One thing do. I want to finish. You want I, to will, I will. No, yeah. no, no. Go, go, go. One thing I want to finish is because we definitely. I went on some tangents, but the reverse dieting. Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Shit. <laughs> but one of, yeah, one, yeah, yeah. yeah, one of the one of the points that I was getting across is that where if you've got things like intestinal permeability, it's probably good that I explain aspects of that. Yeah, okay. Uh, I've got assimilation issues and, you know, you've got bacterial complications, like whether that's small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, um, things like CFO, small intestinal fungal overgrowth, whatever that might be, negative gram bacteria, then that's going to cause absorption and assimilation issues. And so what people need to understand is your base metabolic rate actually goes up. It doesn't decrease, it goes up, okay? And actually that's why I've had individuals where, you know, we've actually had to, like increase their calories because there were there was issues with um, their metabolism it was sluggish and there was down regulation of their their thyroid hormones and so forth but their base metabolic rate end up being way higher than you probably would have expected because of the underlying gastrointestinal problems on top of that okay now over time when we actually fix the gastrointestinal problems and we fix the absorption and you know essentially did things like leaky gut protocols and realign the microbiome and that all of a sudden with the calories that were set out yeah, okay they actually started to put on weight okay now why did they start to put on weight because now their true base metabolic rate was coming out because they were able to absorb and assimilate the nutrients properly does that make sense so once you fix the gut issues one, once we fix the gut issues yeah okay because what people were calculating their base metabolic rate and that's why when people go oh this is what this individual's base metabolic rate is and i go in this moment in time potentially but it's probably not what it really is yeah okay because if they've got all these other issues that's not what it really is does that make sense yeah okay so actually you know this individual um and this was actually a female in this instance you know her her base metabolic rate was you know her, her base worked out at about 2800 calories yeah okay and so she was eating that amount of calories and she was getting leaner okay but as we fix the gastrointestinal problems okay that amount of calories was actually she was putting on body fat yeah so we actually because we'd improved the absorption the uptake okay like people need to understand and so i've seen that in person after person after person that their base metabolic rate with these gastrointestinal problems is actually we have to increase their calories okay so when it comes to the reverse dieting aspect like 
people need to understand you need to take this stuff into account the brain stress gut. okay and the gut okay gut but place. we're we're but we're only really taking into consideration okay you know uh what your lean muscle mass is what your what your body weight is and what your energy expenditure is and this formula is broken yeah okay this formula is broken yeah okay you really need to calculate all the other things and when it comes to reverse dieting yeah okay the problem is because people are dealing with a you know down regulated things like ghrelin so they've got no hunger yeah okay and that's why most of the time people would go well i don't feel hungry and i go yeah but hunger is a good thing it's actually showing showing me that you're anabolic okay that you're stimulating more anabolic hormones like testosterone and growth hormone this is a mate this is what i want to see with someone with fat burning they want they want to run around they almost want to eat their own arm off yeah okay like not having a, not having hunger is is not necessarily a great sign of where your metabolism metabolism is yeah okay and so um you know how i was bringing up this research paper about you know harvard medical university with these guys and their base metabolic rate they calcul- calculated at 3400 they actually dropped them down to about 1700 calories only 50 percent deficit i'd say most people drop their calories even way lower than that yeah okay and they actually sat back and just recorded some of the neurological complications that occurred but also obviously that caused a down regulation in their thyroid and the down regulation in the thyroid actually led to things like uh, even things like suicidal tendencies, yeah, okay, because the thyroid is so important for neurological behavior, and neurological frame of mind, yeah, okay. Now, if that's happening in men, okay, and I'm basically saying that, you know, um, it, huge decrease in, in calories because of the hormo- hormonal complexity of females, okay, it's going to be even more severe in females. Okay, and so could that be leading to a lot of their neurological complications and so forth, these huge calorie deficits? Yeah, does that make sense? Yeah, okay. So the, the, one of the uh, points that I want to get across is that if the, if the thyroid is dependent on calorie intake and then essentially it gets down-regulated, yeah, okay, one of the aspects is that is if the body perceives it's in starvation mode, yeah, okay, now what, what is it going to do with the food that's coming in? Essentially, it's going to store it, yeah, okay, because it wants to store reserves. Does that make sense? Okay, and we need to understand also the first sixty percent of the protein that you consume goes towards healing your immune system. If I'm only uh, consuming small amounts of food, okay, the first sixty percent goes towards healing my immune system. Does that leave a lot for other functions in the body? So a lot of these other functions really break down, and that will include areas like your brain and so forth. And that's why people get like poor short-term to long-term memory, neurological issues, hormonal issues, and so forth. Does that make sense? It's like a huge cascade effect in the body, yeah, okay? Um, so um, I just lost my chain of thought, yeah, okay? It's a lot of trains of thought you've got <laughs> going on. It's like, it's like a circus, it must be in your head. <laughs> yeah, but like one, one of the, you know, one of the major points that, uh, that I want to get across, yeah, okay, is that for females that these huge drop in calories can be way more detrimental to their yeah. hormonal function and neurological frame, frame of mind and so forth so if the body is in this sort of fat storing realms yeah okay and let's say you know the the female was consuming like 1100 calories or 1200 calories yeah, okay and then all of a sudden we just go well we calculated base metabolic rate based on all the things that I've already talked about and that worked out at 2,600 calories and then we start to reverse diet and we jump it up by 500, 600 calories, okay? We understand that the, the body is essentially still in a fat storing realms, okay? And so when you increase the calories by that much, what do you think essentially the body's going to do? It's still in fat storing because you haven't stimulated you know, uh, things like ghrelin, like hunger hormones, you haven't stimulated anabolic hormones and so forth. Does that make sense? And well, it also depends on the macronutrient profile, doesn't it? So yeah. the relative ratio of glucose to fat to protein. And that, and that can be completely different according to the complications and the issues that the individual's got going on. Yeah, okay. That's, a, a com- you know, another conversation in itself. Yeah, okay. But, but, but also, yes, if you can, if you increase the calories, especially for females, like too quickly, essentially they can blow out like a balloon. Yeah, okay. And so it's really important with reverse dieting that we're only jumping. You know, if it was eleven hundred calories, and we're trying to get up towards that two thousand six hundred, mm. which we may not need to get to. You, 
Yeah, okay. And you that, just want to see. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. might do it at 2,000. Yeah, yeah. But like, if you make and thousand, that might stimulate their metabolism and their anabolic hormones and so forth, as you said, at about 2,000, 2,200. We want to do it like nice and slowly. Yeah. So we increase the calories by like 200 calories. Yeah, okay. What frequency? Every two weeks, every month? Uh, it can be different from person to person, but generally I like to go like every two weeks. Yeah, okay. Um, and But for, fem- for, for men, the jump can be more aggressive. Yeah, okay. Because men can really take these extreme increases and drops. And so for a male, I could potentially increase it from 1,100 to 1,600. Yeah, okay. So I could jump it up a lot quicker. Once again, because men tend to respond better to these, you know, uh, huge decreases or even more rapid uh, increases in their calories. Yeah, okay. Um, so yeah, it's just some of the things that I wanted to like. It's it's got to be a different formula yeah. for females. Yeah, okay. And you don't need to necessarily increase someone's calories all the way to their you know to their base metabolic rate but you need to take into consideration a lot of the other things that i was talking about to truly calculate their base metabolic rate in that moment in time and once you fix a lot of those issues the base metabolic rate is most likely going to change for that individual okay does that make sense yeah Yeah. it's important distinctions to make between male and female and how to titrate up accordingly now what I wanted to ask you, because you're a pretty lean guy and you're in your 40s and you've maintained that for quite some time, but I wanted to ask you what, your, what are your nutrition principles around bulking up and staying lean? Because I'm in my nutrition physiology unit right now, we're talking about the biochemistry and metabolism of glucose, fat, and protein. And what was particularly interesting was that the more glucose you consume, the more glucose you oxidize, okay? Ramps up in, in conjunction. Now, the more fat you consume, especially in the presence of a high glucose, high carb, the more fat you're going to store away. So the macronutrient profiling is important because if you're in a surplus, your fat is high and your carbs are high, and we're just talking about macronutrients, not taking into consideration all the other components, then with those two together, they're a pretty bad recipe for uh, body composition and fat storage, which is basically a justification for how the high carb, low fat bodybuilding diet had worked for so many. Now, you, I know you, you probably have different thoughts on that, but what are your thoughts on that and how to stay lean while bulking under the consideration of that? Yeah, I mean, look, just on those, some of those aspects when it comes to like fat storing hormones and, and so forth, well, you look at, I'll just use an example of like, you know, people are pretty big on like a ketogenic diet, yeah, okay? Um, you know, one of the advantages of a ketogenic diet is to get into ketosis. There's a conversation for another time, but actually the, 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 the more efficient um, process to actually get into ketosis is just to fast, yep. right? And that just is going to depend on the person, what, what's going to be the right type of fasting, okay? Yeah, it's actually interesting because you actually look at a, ke- uh, a, ketos- uh, like a, a ketogenic outline, well, that's about 85% fats. Okay, so 85% fats, 10% protein, 5% coming from carbohydrates. Yeah, okay, roughly. Okay, it's interesting because a lot of your, your expectation would be in that instance, if you get into ketosis and so forth, then it, sh- it should obviously help with things like fat burning and so yeah. forth. But a lot of people who stay on a ketogenic diet for too long, they actually, you know, fat storing happens. Yeah, okay, and the reason that fat storing happens is because when you're consuming high amounts of fats, you stimulate a a fat storing hormone and that's called acylation stimulating protein okay the problem is when you stimulate that particular uh, hormone okay that acylation stimulating protein also stimulates insulin so you actually stimulate and that's why a lot of people on the ketogenic they go oh, i'm starting to actually put on more body fat around the midline and so forth because now you're stimulating uh, two fat storing hormones you're stimulating insulin and you're stimulating acylation stimulating protein and so that to, that's actually in the realms of what you're talking about when you actually go you know high fat and also you're consuming high amounts of glucose at the same st- time because the high fat will stimulate the acylation stimulating protein the high high amounts of glucose it's going to stimulate insulin to you know two fat storing hormones is a recipe for disaster right does that make sense yeah okay um so and and that you know that that realms can be even a little bit worse for 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 men yeah okay and why can it be a little bit worse for men because you look at females well females sort of had the advantage of uh, estrogen okay and the the advantage of estrogen it actually helps to um, preserve the uh, glycogen stores. Yeah. Okay. So hence why a lot of females can do a lot better on a 
um, iso- isocaloric sort of regime, actually getting a good balance between the fats, the the carbohydrates, and the protein. Okay, at the uh, at the same time. Yeah. Okay. Now, uh, it also can heavily dependent on whether you're in a, a calorie deficit yeah. or w- whether you're in a, a, yeah. a calorie surplus. So, you know, a recipe for disaster would be to eat like an even ratio between your fats and your carbohydrates and your protein in a calorie surplus. Okay, but as if, a male. And, and, a, and a male would be even worse. Yeah, right, okay? but female too, you Yeah, say. but even in a female, yeah, okay. And so, but in, in, a, in a deficit, yeah, okay, then to actually cover a lot of the realms, if I can get a good balance yeah. between all three, yeah. because there's, there's advantages to all three. Exactly. Yeah, okay, does that make you sense? You need fat, you need carbs, you exactly. need Exactly, so they, like, you know, isocaloric regime can really work when it, well, obviously it's in a deficit because then you're covering all three spectrums and the advantages that they have internally in the body. Do you know what I mean? So, you know, um, when it when it comes to like myself, yeah, okay, like if, if people want to understand, because the one thing I want to say with nutrition, because it is a complicated beast, yeah, okay? And the reason that it's a complicated beast is also, you know, my big point is um, gastrointestinal issues can really change the ball game. And what I mean by that is, the gut will supersede what you may actually respond well to naturally. Okay, so let's say, for instance, you know, like people might go, I'm a fast oxidizer, which is really dependent on your, your mineral balance. Yeah, okay, so a fast oxidizer, people do well on, you know, uh, like, like uh, uh, slow burning fuels. Okay, and so slow burning fuels would be like fats and protein. Okay, but once again, I'm, like, I'm not going to get into the whole realms of the mineral balance and so forth. And then people are slow oxidizers, which means they basically do better on fast burning fuels, which be more like carbohydrates and so forth. But it's really dependent on where your immune system is sitting. You know, people are hypocortisolemic, which means their cortisol levels on the low side, they're going to be more slow oxidizers. People are hypocortisolemic, which means more acute phase of stress, they're going to tend to be more fast oxidizers. Yeah, okay. So your mineral balance is going to completely change how you metabolize macronutrients yeah, okay now that doesn't mean your your your, your mineral balance is going to stay like that for the rest of your life so you there's no way you're a slow oxidizer for the rest of your life or a fast oxidizer yeah, okay now likewise if i've got particular like gastrointestinal issues well if i've got something like candida or yeast well candida and yeast feeds on sugars and 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 carbohydrates okay so how do you think you're going to go if you're consuming like you know a high carbohydrate macronutrient regime okay well that's not going to go too well for you okay and the reason being is because the byproducts from the yeast and the candida and the same thing applies for parasites like blastocystis hominis and dentamoeb fagilis the byproduct is acetaldehyde okay and acetaldehyde is the same thing you get from yeast fermentation you know, uh, car exhaust fumes, alcohol, cigarette smoke, okay? Now, acetaldehyde is a neurotoxin and your body will convert alcohol into ethanol, yeah, okay? Uh, then into acetaldehyde, acetate, carbon dioxide, H2O. So, because it's a neurotoxin, it just wants to get it out of the system, okay? Um, now, the acetaldehyde, if the, if there's certain compounds that you require to clear the acetaldehyde out of the system, yeah, okay? And so that would be things like glutathione, okay? Uh, NAD, you know, okay, which is a particular enzyme, you know, okay. But you look at some of these things, like glutathione plays a key role in the mitochondria within within the cell for energy, and NAD, okay, you actually need that for energy, yeah, okay. So you need it for things like uh, glucose, carbohydrate metabolization, and fat metabolization, because it, it, NAD is a derivative from niacin, vitamin B3, yeah, okay. And so the point I'm trying to get across here is is that basically, if I've got excess amounts of um, acetaldehyde being caused by the yeast and the candida and so forth and then you understand that because it wants you to consume more carbohydrates and sugars and refined carbohydrates and so forth you and it's very hard to resist that urge does that make sense so you're going to consume more of that but out of the three things that i've just talked about acetaldehyde glucose and carbohydrate metabolization and fat metabolization which one is going to be prioritized when it comes to you, the, the usage of the niacin and the NAD and the and the glutathione. Well, the acetaldehyde, because it's a neurotoxin, it's damaged your brain cells and actually damages your cells in your gut lining, which means glucose and carbohydrate metabolization and fat metabolization come to a slow grind, okay? And so why would I go bombard the body with more sugars and carbohydrates when I'm really struggling to metabolize them for energy? 
Does that make sense? So in that instance, but that person, maybe ancestrally or from an epigenetics aspect, maybe they actually do better on more carbohydrates, but the gastrointestinal problem superseded yep. the the um, ancestral the or, the, 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 yep. or, or the underlying preference to how that individual utilizes nutrients. Yes. Does that make sense? Like it's, it's one point that I always try to get across to people. I, I must... Because that will supersede it. It doesn't matter if you're a slow oxidizer, fast oxidizer, do better on carbohydrates. Because if you if you if you do better on carbohydrates and you're feeding the yeast and the candida the carbohydrates, okay, that's just creating more inflammation. It's causing issues with the brain. Okay, that's going to be a bigger problem. To to, to does that make sense? So you've got to alleviate that. Then once you've like peeled back the layers of the onion. Okay, then, okay, now you may actually do better on just consuming more carbohydrates. Does that make sense? Yeah. Once okay. you peel back those layers, though, in a healthy gut environment, what is your stance on macronutrient percentage profiling? Yeah, because the then, yeah, so then now we can really uncover where the actual individual, like how do they, um, what do they naturally do well on? Yeah, yeah. okay. And, and that can come down to like how insulin sensitive they are. Yeah, yeah. okay. Um, there, there is going to be ancestral elements. It, get, it gets a little bit murky with that one for me because we're so mixed race yeah. now. Yeah, okay. Like it's still a factor, but once again, that that can uh, you know be extremely hard because you know a lot of the time we can go, oh well, people in the equator, well they tend to have higher amounts of carbohydrates yeah. in there, and, and you probably heard me talk about that before in the yeah. nutrition outline. But there's exceptions to the rule, you know, like the Masai Mara, which is basically in Kenya and that's close to the equator, but the Masai Mara, the predominant amount of their uh, macronutrient breakdown comes from saturated fat. <laughs> okay, so that flies- Which can be problemsome for a whole bunch of other people who like to have but, FTO genes. Yeah, but yeah, but potentially. And, that, and then the whole, the whole thing is that I could also say, you know, certain countries, you know, close to the equator, there's also a poverty aspect mm. okay and what's what you know what's going to what's going to be cheaper beans and and white rice or animal lard yeah okay well animal lard is far more expensive than beans and and white rice yeah okay and so it is 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 it the ideal nutritional outline for them to be consuming truckloads of beans and white rice or is it just the case that that's all they can afford does that make sense so you look at a lot of those countries like peru and you know ethiopia where they have generally a high carbohydrate content within their normal nutritional regime but i'm just saying there's a poverty aspect there as well does that make sense yeah it gets quite hard to diffuse that ancestral aspect and so forth yeah okay um so yes there's many many different factors to take into consideration with the individual and you know a big thing that i say with nutrition is that uh you know I'm not big on one particular nutritional regime for the rest of your life, okay? Like, the, it's really going to depend on, you know, um, lifestyle factors. It's going to depend on how hard you're training, okay? It's going to depend on, um, you know, like how stressed you are, yeah, okay? It's, um, and there's benefits to, to ebbing and flowing yes. bet, bet, between and particu particular nutritional regimes because with that diversity also creates diversity with the microbiome and, and the microbiome are, de are dependent. Like a lot of people go, oh, when you switch to a high fat regime, it completely changes the microbiome diversity. Of course. It's changing yeah. moment in time, it, day to day. It, exactly. And like actually with, um, you know, like rotation of food, that's a, that's a good thing yeah. for the, for the, for the microbiome. We, we, you yeah, know, seasonally. Yeah. Well, the, the whole thing is like your food sensi sensitivities change every three to four months. Yeah, okay, which means, you know, because like, and that's really based on rotation. Yeah, okay, and different types of microbiome, they respond to, they help you metabolize different types of compounds within foods. Okay, like oxalobacter former genes, which I think you might have heard me talk about before, but oxalobacter former genes, the role of that particular bacteria is to help you break down oxalates. Now, oxalates is what you get from almonds, spinach. cacao, spinach. Ta like taro leaves yeah okay and uh, an oxalate is a are you convinced it's an anti-nutrient decreases the bioavailability of other nutrients I just, it's a, for me it's just a normal compound found in food and then your body has the ability with the microbiome to break down the excess amounts of oxalates okay so you understand it's actually intestinal permeability that has created a big issue with the oxalate factor yeah okay because you 
because the, the gastrointestinal lining is basically the terrain, it's the, it's the environment that houses the microbiome. If we ruin the terrain, then you've, you ruin the, the ratios of the microbiome. And one of those ones that you can affect is the oxalobacter former genes. Okay, that's why they're back. And so if, if I use a bit of a cascade effect here, the oxalobacter former genes helps you break, so it needs to interact with the oxalate. So if you're not eating many oxalates, you're not going to have a huge amount of oxalobacter former genes. Well, that makes sense. Okay, Does, you understand what I'm saying? So, so that, that when I'm, I'm not saying that it's bad to eat almonds and cacao and so forth. It's completely normal. Yeah, okay. And you have bacteria in there that helps you break down the excess amounts of oxalates. Now, let's say I've got a compromised gut lining and I don't have enough oxalobacter former genes, and now I'm consuming huge amounts of sweet potato and these types of things, which are exceptionally good for you. Okay. Well, then now the oxalates accumulate. And when the oxalates accumulate, they basically bind to minerals. And so they bind to things like magnesium, potassium, sodium, and they also bound to calcium. So they'll form things like magnesium oxalate, calcium oxalate. Now, the first three that I mentioned, yeah, okay, um, they're, more, they're, they're more water soluble, okay? And so it sort of binds to the magnesium, binds to the potassium, binds to the sodium and renders the mineral useless, non-bioavailable. Now, what's going to happen? Well, the body just wants to flush that out the system and it'll flush it through urine so it flushes it through the kidneys but they're water soluble calcium oxalate is a different story because it's not as water soluble as the other minerals does that make sense okay and so it gets stuck in the little filters in the kidney and that actually causes like uh, calcium deposits okay and when it causes calcium deposits that's kidney stones okay and so the kidney stones so we could say well we don't really know what causes the kidney stones or we could say trace it right back and go, well, actually the problem existed with the intestinal permeability and the compromisation of the, the gastrointestinal lining. Now, people will say, okay, in that instance, you should avoid oxalates. Okay, I avoid oxalates. Problem's still there. Problem's still there. It doesn't fix the problem. So yeah. you should only have like 50 grams of oxalates. I'm not going to go around for the rest of my life weighing out fix 50 grams <laughs> of oxalates, yeah, okay? <laughs> and this is just a madness. It's just food avoidance. Yeah. Does that make sense? Which a lot of the time I, I abided by that system for a long time. And yes, it alleviates the in inflammatory the load. Yeah. It alleviates the symptoms. It's not going to fix your problem. Yeah. You avoiding oxalates and us demonizing oxalates is not fixing the but problem. But what you're saying right now, it's not about fucking oxalates or gluten or dairy or saturated fat it's the principle and ideology of demonizing food groups and one of the best things i've heard you say and i want you to talk about it now is we just we don't want to demonize food group because the food isn't the problem like we're the problem yes the, so it's how you're interacting with the food that is the problem so one problem is so all these debates that we're getting on you know that we're having with food okay like is it more plant-based? Is it is a vegetarian regime? Or is it carnivore? Yeah. Okay. How do you deal with that, Dave? <laughs> How does that not because just drive I, you crazy? Because I just come from obviously a completely different school of thought. Yeah. Okay. And I'm not disputing that the people who move to these particular regimes benefit. got benefit. Yeah. I'm not disputing that. Yeah. Okay. But what's 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 leading us into these extreme regimes? And I'm telling you one factor that is leading us, and this for me that the evidence is there, okay, that is leading us into these extreme nutritional regimes is the gut lining, okay? If I just give you an example of those two extremes, because these, these are extremes for me, and I'm not saying some people don't do exceptionally well on a, a vegan outline. I'm not saying that at all. Don't want people to come after me. Yeah, oh, they'll okay? come anyway. <laughs> okay, I'm not saying that. Some people, ancestrally, whatever that might be, can definitely do way better on a, a vegan regime than they would do more heavy animal protein, animal fats. Sure. Not disputing that. Likewise, people need to understand that there's certain people who are going to do better on a heavy animal protein, animal fat regime. But the okay? plant group wants to tell you, you got to come on my side. 97% of pop, trust me, the population eats meat, but they want the whole population. And, and this is the problem. And I'd say the same thing with the carnivore yes, regime. Well yeah, okay, said. Like yes. people are basically saying, well, no, you should be eating more uh, animal protein. Yes. We should predominantly be there. And, yeah. and, and, and so I want to clear out by saying, yes, there's a small fraction of the population that sit here. And I'm talking small. And there's a small, so that's the, the you know, more plant-based, vegan, yeah, okay? And then there's a very, very small 
uh, fraction of the population that sit in the carnivore regime. But there's a huge proportion of the population that's sitting in the more omnivore regime. Yeah, okay. And the, the problem here, so let's, if we go to the vegan, the vegetarian, more plant-based regime, okay, well, where can some of the issues lie here to why I might, may feel better eating more vegetable fibers, more carbohydrate uh, fibers, you know, good clean carbohydrates I'm talking about here, more tubers, all these types of things. I'm not disputing how um, nutritionally dense and and how you know um, how beneficial they can be for the microbiome. You know, I'm not getting into that side of things. Yeah, okay, but if I've got issues with like the paratel cells, which are the the epithelium, the mucosal cells, and the stomach lining, okay, and the big thing that I want to get across here is that I've got issues producing hydrochloric acid. Okay, now hydrochloric acid basically helps with uh, uh, pepsinogen. That basically gets converted into pepsin, okay? And the pepsin, this is enzymes, the pepsin actually helps to take protein, break it down into, you know, uh, polypeptides, okay? Break it down into peptides. And so we're taking large molecules and then breaking them down into singular molecules. This is a very important process, yeah, okay? Um, and also the hydrochloric acid helps to separate B12 from protein. That's pretty important, okay? Considering B12 plays a role pretty much in every cell in the body, yeah, okay? And then B12, you need for serotonin, dopamine, um, central nervous system, yeah, okay? You need it for your cranial nerves, like this is incredibly and pre- important. predominantly found in animal products. Yeah, we won't get into into, into this that, that whole aspect. It's definitely a conversation for another time, yeah, okay? Got you. But, but uh, also it helps to, because it helps with the, the amino acids and breaking down the chains of amino acids into smaller chains of amino acids, but it also helps to separate the the, the lipids and, and the fats from the protein as well. It's really, really important processes, yeah, okay? Now, hydrochloric acid, you need a bit of a soup, yeah, okay? And so you need ingredients to enable you to produce sufficient amounts of hydrochloric acid. How do we generally know when people have got hydrochloric acid issues, okay? Well, they get off put by the thought of eating meat. Okay, and I'm going to get to that a little bit more. Okay, they have gut distension quite high up in the gut. Oh, okay, high up. Huh. Yeah, okay, they have things like bad breath. Okay, they get things like belching. Okay, so they tend to burp after food. Yeah, okay, there can be other complications there. One issue they can have is H. pylori or Helicobacter overgrowth. Yeah, okay, because Helicobacter overgrowth affects the acidifying effects of hydrochloric acid. That makes yeah, ammonia, okay. doesn't it? Yeah, like it's all to do with urease. Yeah, okay, and so. The, the 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 whole issue with uh, helicobacter uh, overgrowth yeah okay? and like that's the, pretty rare isn't it well they base they look there's there's things where they say about 50 percent of the population have h pylori what who says this that it's basically a statistic that they they do 50 percent yeah about 50 percent of the population do you like this? it's not something that i see on a regular basis yeah okay but i do believe that definitely people can have issues within the stomach lining, uh, you know, and like look more, some of the more common symptoms of not producing enough hydrochloric acid would be like gastric reflux, heartburn, yeah, okay. And then they're going to tell you to take this acid reflux tablets on TV. Well, the, the reason that you're obviously getting the, the heartburn and the, and the gastric reflux is because basically the, the animal protein and the protein that you're consuming because you're not producing enough hydrochloric acid to uh, essentially help with things like pepsinogen and pepsin, where you essentially that the, the the protein is not getting broken down in the stomach properly. Mm. Okay, if it's not getting broken down in the stomach properly, it's going to cause like a, a reflux coming back, like heartburn and so forth. It's because you've got low stomach acid, you're not able to break it down efficiently. And you got to understand if you're not breaking down efficiently in the in the stomach lining, it gets passed down to the small intestine where essentially it should already be broken down a lot further and that causes even further problems where you can get things like putrefaction okay basically where this meat sits there and rots and it actually encourages you know particular uh, protein fermenting microbiome and they release gases yeah okay and those gases can cause things like belching and all these types of things and you get things like um, you know, like gurgling in the stomach and fermentation issues. So it creates another problem further, f- like further downstream. Does that make sense? Okay. But basically, if, you know, if I don't have the right ingredients for the hydrochloric acid, like, you know, things like zinc, you know, there's a zinc hydrochloric acid cycle. Yeah. Okay. So zinc needs a acidic state uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the stomach to actually help with its uptake. But also you need hydrochloric acid to enable you to produce uh, um, you need hydrochloric acid to enable you to absorb zinc and you need zinc to enable you to produce hydrochloric acid. It's a vicious cycle. Does that mean you should yeah. take it with food or fasting? 
Uh, look, Does that matter? Yeah, like a lot of the time, it, it depends on the form of zinc. Yeah, zinc a com- yeah, Zinc L-carnosine is the one that I use, but I'm using it more from an antimicrobial perspective because it's already bound to an amino acid. So in that case, so it's bound to the L- Yeah, so more fasted in that instance because okay. yeah, it allows the zinc to also stick around and that's why you don't get that sort of like nausea feeling. You will get it if you've got like negative gram bacteria and things like H. pylori because zinc L-carnosine actually helps against those things. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, you know, something like a zinc picolinate would be better with food. with food in that instance. Yeah. Okay. Once again, it d- it depends on the form of the zinc that you're taking. Okay. But you also need B1, which is thiamine. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I won't go. Yeah. yeah it helps with neurological frame of mind. Yeah. Okay. Um, also helps with like estrogen clearance. Yeah. Okay. But you need uh, vitamin E. Yeah. Okay. And there's like eight different types of vitamin E. There's uh, alpha tocopherol and gamma tocopherol. Yeah. Okay. But a lot of the time when you're consuming too many omega-6s, so things like linoleic acid, arachidonic acid, okay, linoleic acid is a, is a big problem because, you know, and it's, I don't want to make it these omega-6s like they're not bad. It's a bad okay? ratio. It's a bad ratio, yeah. yeah, okay? And so if you're having a lot of things like safflower oil and, you know, um, cottonseed oil and all these types of things, you can have like too much linoleic acid. The problem there is you have too much linoleic acid, it actually depletes vitamin E. Okay, you deplete. That's why you know in this instance, these, these people would get gut dysbiosis. And the reason they get the gut dysbiosis is because we need the vitamin E for the hydrochloric acid. Okay, you also need chloride, which is the most negatively charged iron in in the body, which we generally should get out of good quality water. Okay, and then we've got bicarbonate, and bicarbonate. Really, the key ingredient here is carbon dioxide. Now, if I've got poor energy systems, yeah, okay, um, and I'm not getting enough oxygen into the mitochondria, then the, the the end result is I don't get enough byproducts. One of those byproducts is carbon dioxide. Now, carbon dioxide mixes with water and flu- uh, mixes with water in the body, and that forms bicarbonate, okay, and bicarbonate is one of the key ingredients that I need for hydrochloric acids. You understand like your energy systems play a big role in your ability to produce hydrochloric acid. So if I don't have good energy systems and I'm not producing sufficient amounts of hydrochloric acid, which macronutrient, okay, which food group am I really going to struggle to break down efficiently? Animal protein. Okay, and so yes, of course you're going to be off put by the thought of eating animal protein. Of course you're going to get gut distinction. Of course it's going to make you feel nauseous. Yeah, okay. But that doesn't mean that you don't need it, okay? What's actually happening is the gastrointestinal problems like the H. pylori and all the things that I've talked about, people would classify as, but I'm intuitively listening to my body, yeah, okay? But you understand the complications that you have in the body. It's a false sense of intuition, okay? And so ultimately what you need to fix here is the issues lying in the paratel cells and so forth, okay? And then you might understand, do you actually yeah. um, feel better when you do consume things like animal protein and so forth? So that's one issue, okay? The other issue is the carnivore regime, okay? So people with autoimmune diseases, okay? People with fermentation issues. The results has been, have you heard? Like people have really transformed how they feel and their well-being. Yeah, because you just, you look at the statistics, yeah, okay? Like, you know, um, yeah, like how many people complain of things like IBD, you know, IBD issues, and that would be things like, so that's obviously irritable bowel disorders, irritable bowel disease, so that'd be things like Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis. I'm going to put diverticulitis in there, even though it's not classified as autoimmune, but it's very similar to complications like ulcerative colitis, fibromyalgia, rheumatoid arthritis. Well, these things are on the increase, yeah, okay? Um, and all these autoimmune conditions do, um, you know, they... they basically stem from things like intestinal permeability and problems with the epithelium and the mucosal cells, yeah, okay? And the other thing is IBS symptoms. So irritable bowel syndrome, yeah, okay? And so 70% of IBS is SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, okay? So the whole thing with SIBO, and you look at one of the nutritional regimes that works in terms of mitigating the symptoms, of, and it does definitely mitigate the symptoms, is a low FODMAP regime. Now, the whole thing with FODMAP is based on fermentation. Okay, so essentially you're avoiding the foods that sit there and ferment for but a longer period of time. There's an extent of fermentation that we want, right? Like fermentation is a, is it a natural process as well? So fermentation is good. I'm not demonizing yeah, yeah, yeah. fermentation. Okay, cool. so the good thing about like fermentation and, you know, predominantly most of that fermentation should take place in the large intestine. Okay, and so basically, you know, um, when you, you, you sweep through the migrating motor complex or the MMC, you're sweep, sweeping the sort of contents of the 
the duodenum or the small intestine through to the large intestine, well, you know, you've got 400 different species of bacteria in your large intestine. And basically, the indigestible matter, that, that, that good bacteria come along, they feed on the indigestible matter, and then they produce short-chain fatty acids short chain fatty acids that help with all these amazing functions within the body and so that's like propionate butyrate acetate butyrate being the big one because it helps with t regulatory cells a type of uh, t cell that basically help your immune system recognize uh, help you recognize your own immune system stopping you from getting things like autoimmune disease yeah, okay so the, the fermentation is a, a cool. good thing yeah, okay but if i've got a fermentation issue within the small intestine where yep. basically which is SIBO the, yeah okay which basically means that the, the the food is sitting there and fermenting for a long period of time then that basically is going to encourage bacterial overgrowth okay now of course what foods are going to um, distress this problem even more well foods that sit there and ferment for a longer period of time okay so and that and and that in in that instance that's going to be a lot of things like vegetable fibers and carbohydrate molecules okay because they're essentially food for the microbiome so of course they're going to sit there and ferment for a longer period of time you actually look at it like one quart of carbohydrates okay equals 10 quarts of hydrogen ions Okay, so we're talking about the gases that get that get released through the fermentation process. Yeah, okay, and so, um, you, you, so if I've got a higher rate of fermentation taking place in the in the small intestine, yeah, okay, then when I'm consuming a lot of vegetable fibers and carbohydrates that sit there and ferment for a longer period of time, then I'm producing through so one quart, one particle is producing ten quarts of. So, uh, I'm just talking about particles here. 950 milliliters. That is one quart, just to put it in perspective. Yeah, yeah. Just yes. have to look it up. Yeah, and so then, then if I'm producing more hydrogen ions, yeah, okay, which basically essentially more gases, yeah, okay, and the hydrogen ions aren't. I'm not saying they're a bad thing in this instance, yeah, okay, but excessive amounts of hydrogen ions in 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 an area where there's not meant to be a huge amount of fermentation, yeah, okay, like the small intestine, the hydrogen ions stimulate these receptors. They're called TRPV1 receptors that causes vasorelaxation. Okay, it causes vasorelaxation. This can lead to things like diarrhea and so forth. So that's through the excess amounts of hydrogen ions. Yeah, okay. And you actually look at it, excess amounts of hydrogen ions. So if I was doing something like a bicep curl, okay, well, you're, you're building, you're, you're increasing excess amounts of lactate. Yeah, okay. And lactate is two pyruvate molecules and one hydrogen ion. Yeah, okay. And it's actually the, the increase in the hydrogen ions that makes your bicep. Uh, feel like it's burning fatigue yeah. Yeah, yeah okay now you understand like excess amounts of like hydrogen ions and especially if i can't clear the excess amounts of hydrogen ions okay essentially how do you think that's going to make you feel mm. yeah fatigued lethargic does that make sense yeah okay and so in the, in this instance where people go well i feel a lot better just eating more like you know animal proteins and animal fats and i don't really eat a lot of like vegetable fibers and carbohydrates well do you think there could be room to say that you have a fermentation issue within the and i'm not disputing uh, disputing that you feel better and why are people maybe getting you know ma amazing results from an energy perspective and also body composition and so forth because you basically you're taking you're reducing the inflammatory load that's being caused by when you do consume those foods yeah okay but in saying that yeah, okay if you if if that nutritional regime doesn't really suit you from an ancestral perspective or whatever that might be, and then you stay on that for a very long period of time, okay, now you might actually create microbiome imbalances, yeah, okay. And if I just use one example, okay, well one of the microbiome that 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 is heavily dependent on carbohydrate molecules and vegetable uh, vegetable molecules would be bifidobacterium, okay. So bifidobacterium, okay, and there's like 30 to 32 different strains of bifidobacterium that we know of okay well if i look at one of those strains bifidobacterium dentium bifidobacterium dentium actually helps with gaba surplus in the brain so gamma amino butyric acid okay inhibitory hormone and it's a, it's an inhibitory neurotransmitter okay and you have the most amount of receptors for gaba okay and out of the like let's say the 122 neurotransmitters that we know of really one of them is you know pretty much solely inhibitory which means it helps to calm and relax the brain it actually helps with um you know uh pain tolerance yeah okay there's all these advantages to that yeah okay and if if the bifidobacterium actually helps with gaba surplus in the brain and then all of a sudden you're you're uh, affecting your neurotransmitter balance by not 
essentially giving the bifidobacterium the food that it requires for higher proliferation, which would be the vegetable fibers and the carbohydrate molecules and so forth, mm. then long term you start to affect your your bifidobacterium levels and what and how does this start to manifest? Well, your brain like your brain can't shut off. You might have you might have poor pain sensitivity. Okay, um, and you know this might actually start to uh, show up in your sleeping patterns. You know, people with um, uh, GABA deficiencies they tend to wake up at 2 a.m. in the morning their brain's going like 100 miles an hour so they tend to wake up they think it's going to be early in the morning and it's 2 o'clock yeah, okay because their brain is just constantly thinking does that make sense okay so and also bifidobacterium actually helps to balance out what we call TH1 and TH2 activity which is basically to do with anti-inflammatory and pro-inflammatory activity so it helps to balance out inflammation in the body so my point being yeah, okay is that yes you, you got the benefits initially but then long term, yeah, okay, you actually start to get the issues of the microbiome imbalances that are actually required through some of the, uh, you know, th through some of the food groups that you're avoiding because of the particular regime that you're on. So then you start to encounter these problems further down the line. Does that make sense? Most people don't realize because they get this acute honeymoon phase. It might last a couple of years, a couple of months, whatever. And it often takes years and years because we don't have longitudinal studies on carnivore or plant-based only. But what I was pulling up now is that deficiency of vitamin, vitamin B12 takes like five years to see like nerve damage and nervous system effects. So it's going to happen. It's going to come. Exactly. And so, so a lot of people go, well, you know, I feel amazing. And, and, but then they start to get these problems. Yeah. Okay? And because they're going to associate, you know, when they were consuming those vegetable fibers and those carbohydrate molecules and so forth, they associate with the dysbiosis and the complications they were getting when they had those fermentation issues. They're ultimately not going to recognize that that potentially where, might be where the problem lies. Yeah. Does that make sense? Because they're going to go, well, I, you know, I got rid of those things and I felt good. Yeah. Okay. So it couldn't be those things that right. essentially may actually make me feel better. Okay. But ultimately what you need to fix is how you interact with those things in the first place. So ultimately, you know, in the instance of the carnivore, you have to fix the fermentation issues. You have to fix potentially things like SIBO or it could be CFO. Yeah, okay. But ultimately, you have to fix the gut motility issues. Okay. Because if you've got poor, if you've got damage to the enteric nervous system, so what I'm talking about is the communication between the gut and the brain. Yeah, okay. Um, you know, and causing complications with the vagus nerve, and the vagus nerve helps with the parasympathetic nervous system. And it also controls the release of the content of food from the stomach to the small intestine. You understand it plays a big role in motility. You've got enteric hormones. One of them is modulin that's actually produced within your your stomach, yeah, okay, um, uh, and your small your, your, the, the cells in your small intestine, and modulin helps with gut motility as well. It helps with intestinal churning, yeah, okay. So you understand if I've damaged the enteric nervous system, yeah, okay, that's affecting motility, which means I'm not churning food properly, okay. If I'm not churning food properly, what's happening? The food is sitting there, it's fermenting, and then it encourages the bacterial overgrowth. Okay, so even if I if I if I get rid of the 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 bacterial issue, okay, and so SIBO is a complex beast in itself because we don't really know what the 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 microbiome ratio yeah. is from one person who's got SIBO to the next, yeah, okay, because you could just have an overgrowth of lactobacillus that could actually be your SIBO, yeah, okay, or you might have an overgrowth of Escherichia coli, but that could be non pathogenic. Escherichia coli, okay, or you could have an overgrowth of non-pathogenic and pathogenic Escherichia coli, okay, or you might have a ratio of Escherichia coli, Clostridium, Bacteroid. So you've got a ratio of many dips, and you can see how people can get different complications associated with the SIBO. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay. So yes, we can get rid of the problem, okay, and that's why there's so many different schools of thought when it comes to getting rid of SIBO and some things work really well for these people some and some things don't and then another group of people this this regime works really really well okay but then you can get rid of the SIBO but we've also got to fix the reason that the SIBO became a problem in the first place so if I didn't if I don't fix what's going on with the enteric nervous system that's going to most likely create a SIBO scenario further down like a relapse of the SIBO further down the line anyway if I don't fix the damage that's happened to the cells, okay, affecting the contractile proteins, affecting the, you know, the brush borders, affecting the release of enzymes, okay, if I haven't fixed that, 
well, do you think we're essentially going to get some sort of fermentation issue again? Of course, yeah, okay. And so people are doing the you know SIBO protocols and they they get rid of the bacteria, but they don't fix the problem. They just get a relapse of the of the SIBO again. Does that make sense? Yeah. What okay. are the root cause problems that you see the most common? Uh, the root the root cause problems of SIBO that you see the most commonly um, that oh are, with gastrointestinal problems and with SIBO. Like, what do you see? Because we know the effects, we know the mechanisms, but why do you think it happens? How do we address the problem? Well, there's there's so many different schools of thought. I mean, what one school of thought it can be triggered by, you know, like food poisoning scenario. Yeah, and, then, well, and dirty water. Yeah, I mean, food. like the, the whole thing is like like you know, I I don't dispute that. I definitely think it can be a a a, a, a severe trigger mechanism. But you got to look at when you when you have some sort of like food poisoning, like where are you actually causing a lot of damage to? Well, you're actually causing a lot of damage to the, the gastrointestinal lining, okay? And the reason you're causing a lot of damage to the gastrointestinal lining because a lot of the time you can be, um, you know, sort of um, damaging the, the epithelium and the mucosal cells even more, yeah, okay? Because most of the time you're, you're like you're purging, yeah, okay? And you're... Uh, and I like you're doing that for a reason, yeah, okay. But you understand that can cause more damage to the gut lining, which was probably compromised in the fir- first place anyway. Okay, so I'm not saying that the food poisoning is not a trigger mechanism to create more damage internally there, but I don't think it's. I I I definitely don't think it's the sole reason contributing to something like a proliferation or an overgrowth of bacteria in the small intestine. Yeah, okay. Some people could say it could be a hydrochloric acid issue, and that can make sense as well because if I've got insufficient production of hydrochloric acid, I'm not breaking down the food properly and then it's getting passed to the small intestine and because it's not broken down properly, it's going to sit there and ferment for a longer yeah. period of time. So that could be one factor, okay? But then also the factor can be if I've got, you know, uh, crypt hyperplasia or villi atrophy where I've damaged the cells in my small intestine and obviously you can have, you know, intestinal permeability and damage to the cells in the large intestine as well, yeah, okay? But if I've damaged... The actual cell, you get things like gastrointestinal fissures, like abrasions in the epithelium. It's called splitting. Well, that damages the contractile proteins. That also damages the the cells, the, you know, the the enterocytes and the cells' ability ability to release enzymes to break down, you know, macromolecules like glucose molecules and lipids and amino acids and so forth. So, um, you know, you can you can like dampen the the brush borders yeah okay and so if you're dampening the brush borders a, a you know a, a a problem with that can be too many like uh, too much inflammation taking place in the body so too many pro-inflammatory proteins okay and they actually blunten the brush borders and if that blunts the brush borders then that affects the release of the enzymes that help you break down things like glucose molecules so things like lactose maltose uh dectrose yeah okay and like sucrose and all these glucose molecules so what's going to happen if you can't release the enzymes like dectrinase and sucrase and lactase and maltase to break down the glucose molecules well they're going to sit there and ferment and if they're sitting there and they're fermenting because you can't release these things properly what's what's that going to encourage it's going to encourage bacterial overgrowth okay so some of that bacteria might already be in the small intestine or you can essentially sometimes get a migration from the colon through the sequel valve and into the small intestine because there's a high amount of fermentation taking place so to answer your question you know it can also be an exacerbation of all that you can have all those problems yeah okay so you could have so yeah so you could have had food poisoning i'm not disputing that being a trigger mechanism you could have also had the issues in the stomach lining so the issues with the hydrochloric acid but you also had you know um you know fissures and abrasions in the in the epithelium you also probably had hyperpermeability you can have all those things okay and then that creates the 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 small intestinal bacterial overgrowth yeah okay um but the problem is like what we're even doing with those types of things is we're alleviating and we're fixing the symptom you know this the symptom is the SIBO yeah okay does that make sense but what actually caused yes. the SIBO? What is it? Yeah, and so and what it's I'm, all these things, right? And it's all and it's an exacerbation of all these things. Yeah. yeah, okay. Likewise, if I'm not if I'm not having a positive impact on what's going on between the communication between my brain and my gut, yeah, okay. And so essentially, if I'm not dealing with childhood trauma, yeah. emotional stress, negative emotions, yeah, okay. Well, whatever's going on in here 
is causing detrimental harm to the enteric nervous system and detrimental harm to areas like the vagus nerve, which makes up your enteric nervous system. So now what you're affecting is you're affecting, you know, transit time of food. You're affecting how the food comes from the stomach to the small intestine. You're having a negative effect on that. Does that make sense? Okay. So once again, is that going to affect motility? Of course. Okay. And if that's affecting motility, then you can see how if I don't address what's going on here, that's also still going to cause problems with intestinal churning and how I'm breaking down food and then ultimately lead to bacterial overgrowth. <sighs> Damn. It's a lot, Dave O'Brien. Yeah. But this is the thing. Yeah. Achieving optimal health is complex sometimes. Um, I want to shift to a topic that we talked about on the phone um, briefly. With this coronavirus going on, um, a vaccine is trying to be created. And are you, are you familiar with Paul Check? Yep, I sure definitely you know Paul Check. There yeah. you go. Yeah. Well, he has some pretty strong thoughts on the pros and cons of vaccines. And I wanted to, something we've never talked about, I wanted to get your two cents on, you know, some, some people and countries and governments are going to do mandatory vaccines. Some mm. occupations have mandatory vaccines, which is a slippery slope to forcibly get people to put... Uh, certain antibodies in their system where they don't necessarily know all the side effects and the pros and cons what, what is how do we pass this conversation out how, because it's complex there's anti-vaxxers there's full vaxxers there's herd immunity it's, where do you sit yeah I, look the, the whole thing with the you know i mean obviously i've got my own you know um i wouldn't say their beliefs yeah okay so even when it came down to you know you know, I've got a baby girl. And so when it actually came down to understanding, you know, the whole aspect with vaccinations and so forth, um, you know, I research, researched it very heavily, but just to understand my partner researched it back to front. Yeah, yeah okay. And so, you know, without getting into to too much debate in terms of obviously what they're putting in vaccines and, you know, like, heavy metals as stabilizers and you know things like aluminium which obviously is linked to neurodegenerative diseases and you know when people go well we consume aluminium that we get out of you know aluminium foil and like aluminium in deodorants and so forth but just to understand the aluminium that you consume through aluminium and foils com is uptaken completely differently yeah. to injection. injecting injecting something yeah. into tissue and into the bloodstream yeah. okay because you're, you're ultimately dealing with, you know, the biggest physical barrier in the body. And what is that biggest physical barrier? Your gastrointestinal lining, okay? Like it, it's it's the thing that basically, because, you know, I'm, I'm talking about the gastrointestinal lining. It, it basically, that's where detoxification starts. Detoxification yes. starts in the gut, yeah, yeah. okay? So the, you're hitting that barrier, yeah, okay? We're, we're not talking about something that bypasses that barrier, goes into the tissue and goes straight into the into the into the bloodstream, yeah, okay? The one thing, you know, with the outgoing out, without going further into so other compounds that they they find in vaccinations and so forth, yeah, okay, is the the one thing that I ask people to do is just don't go into things blindly, yeah, yeah, okay, Absolutely. like and like. Do your own research, and if you if if you do your own research, okay, and then you conclude that the best course of action, okay, is that your that vaccinations from your research, there's a huge benefit there. I respect it, okay. I respect that decision because you've researched both sides of the fence. It's most the, the, the one thing I know, like with everything that I do, okay, is that you've got to research both sides of the fence. You cannot just blindly, because a lot of the time, like people, you know, whether it's anti-vaxxers or it's, or it's pro. you know, your yeah. pro-vaccinators, -vaccin yeah. is they're just basing an opinion with zero research. Yeah, that's the problem. Yeah, that's a huge problem in anything. It's yeah, based okay. on ideology and dogma. Yeah, it's like, like so what I'm saying to people is is research. And like even when you start to understand certain things that potentially could be in the vaccinations, whether that be particular heavy metals like aluminium, will go away and research the impact of aluminium on the body. They don't just go, oh, there's potentially aluminium in here. 
go away and research the impact of aluminium in the body. So you understand the negative uh, impact that that potentially can have to areas like your brain. Yeah, okay. Like it's not just not just research it from that perspective perspective but research it even further okay one thing that i'm really trying to teach people when it comes to the immune system is let's start looking after the areas that basically make up your immune system okay because we're definitely not doing that okay so if we look at innate immune system yeah okay so innate immune system so one thing that we're focusing on with the coronavirus yeah okay is y- your skin is a barrier and it is okay it's connective tissue okay i'm not disputing that it is a barrier it's not the biggest physical barrier in the human body, okay? The biggest physical human barrier is the gastrointestinal lining. So you know how I was talking right about right at the start, I was talking about the connective tissue, the mucosa. If I actually stretched out, so that, you know, I talked about the gut-associated lymphoid tissue. If I stretched out that connective tissue, it would stretch for 240 to 300 meters, which is the size of 10 tennis courts. Now, why haven't, considering it's a physical barrier, why haven't we put any importance on this? It's criminal. Yeah, okay, like that, that is absolutely criminal that we're not teaching people about the area where the highest amount of antigen and antibody response takes place. So let's talk about an immune response. One immune response would be me cutting my skin, yeah? Okay, and what's the risk of when I cut my skin? Infection. It creates an immune response. Let's ask ourselves a question. How often are you cutting your skin? More common than you think, probably. It's not that often, though. Yeah, okay? Now, where would the highest amount of immune response take place on a regular occurrence? Eating. Mm, Okay? The gut lining. Okay? But yet, we think, okay, so even when it's, it's like a virus, okay? You breathe in a virus, yeah, okay, or you 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 basically, uh, it's it's going through your mouth, yeah, okay, or obviously, um, you some know. mucous membrane, yeah, okay, and that okay is going to hit hit in the instance of something like the coronavirus, it's going to hit like the epithelium in the because the epithelium, in the in the in the lungs, is very similar in like. T- the, the, the high majority of the, the epithelium in the lungs is goblet cells, okay? And you've got goblet cells in your large intestine as well, okay? And so that epithelium in your lungs, okay, is, is just smooth muscle. It's connective tissue. It's made up of hydroxyproline, proline, glycine, arginine. You need vitamin C that helps with the repair of collagen. You need uh, B6, pyridoxine. You need manganese. You need copper. You need zinc. That's the soup that you need. It's the same thing you, you need for the cells in the stomach, like the paratel cells, the small intestine, the large intestine. Yeah, okay. Um, and so this is a this is an area that's to do with antigen response, antibody response. Basically, what I'm talking about here is is a recognition process. It's got to go. What is that? Okay. All right. This is what we need to do. Okay. Or, or it could be a compound and say we need that. Okay. We're going to utilize that. Or okay, th- we need to create an immune response to deal with this. Okay. And so that's taking place all the time. And I don't want you to think that antigen response. It's just like your body's response to a foreign uh, microorganism. Okay. And so that can be molecules that you find in food. Okay. That creates an immune response. It's not a bad thing. Okay. But you understand that response is taking place in your gastrointestinal lining on a frequent basis. That's why your gastrointestinal lining is the most protective lining in the human body. Okay. Now, what happens if that's compromised? Your innate immune system is down. That's a problem. Okay. Now, also, what's part of your innate immune system? So, remember, I said that you produce up anywhere from ten to twenty percent of your circulating white blood cells comes from your gut lining. There's actually evidence to show that that production may be increasing. Now, why? Why potentially might your the lamina propria and the and the the, the gut the gut associated lymphoid tissue have to produce higher amounts of B cells because of the compromisation of the gut lining because if there's a higher compromisation of the gut lining it's going to create more immune response does that make sense yeah okay um, so th- like we we forget that potentially ten to twenty percent of your circulating white blood cells comes from your gastrointestinal lining yes it also comes from your stem cells and that's part of your innate immune system as well so that comes back to what i was talking about with things like vitamin a vitamin c yeah um vitamin d sort of governing that okay 
folate yeah okay if you've got methylation issues there could be some problems there yeah okay um you know so 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 essentially these you know these micronutrients yeah okay they're also key players in your innate immune system so that's your innate immune system and how much emphasis would you say that we're putting uh when it comes to um immunity yeah okay and protecting ourselves on the gut lining fuck all <laughs> exactly it's close to zero it's close to zero if, and, if, and if it's if it's part of your innate immune system Okay, and it's it's going to help with immunity, and we're putting zero emphasis on it. This is a big problem. Mm. Okay, and then you've got your acquired immune system, which yeah, is through yeah. the exposure to certain b- bacteria and viruses. Is that what you're referring to? Yeah, well, your acquired immune system would be things like your lymphocytes. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah. and so your yeah, and so your lymphocytes. You've got your T cells, you've got your B cells, you've got your natural killer cells, and a big player there is vitamin c okay vitamin c helps with the synthesis of lymphocytes it helps with the synthesis of white blood cells yeah okay and then um you know also like the b cells yeah okay and so the b cells are to do with that antigen response now what's the big player there i've already talked about it yeah okay and that's actually the mucosa okay and it's the gut associated lymphoid tissue so once again it's like your gut lining is part of the acquired immune system okay and so if if it's such a big player in basically what make because that's it what makes up our immune system is the innate immune system and the acquired immune system. Now, would you say that the gut lining is a big player in everything that I've just talked about? Yes, sir. It's huge. Yes. Okay, and we put zero emphasis on it. And so, when it comes to building up our immune system, okay, what we really need to start looking at is soil quality. Yeah. Okay. We need to look at like the the you know what micronutrients are within that what microbes yeah okay um improve that quality yeah okay that's gonna that's gonna uh, play a big role in improving what's going on internally but also starting to repair the structure or the damaged structure that is that ultimately is taking place in a lot of uh in a lot of people yeah okay um and when we start to take a care of that this is vitally going to improve our immunity yeah okay to the extent that maybe vaccines would be not as needed is that where we're trying to go with this conversation it's it's a it's a it's a massive because as i said um I, i don't tend to like to get into the debates about direct vaccinations now why because it's not an area of my expertise Fair enough. Yeah, does that, Absolutely yeah, fair enough. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Where I go, okay, so let's look at an area that I am well educated right. in, yeah, okay. okay, which Got is you. which is the gut lining and so forth. Done. And if that is a big part of your immune system and we're putting very little focus on it, okay, how do you think our immunity is going to be? Right. It's, it's going to be extremely poor. Does that make sense? Yeah, so okay. control what we can control. And that's our immune system. That's our gut. That's su- smart supplementation, whole nutritious foods, um, all these important points. But I think the toxicity point on the vaccines is important. Uh, you know, I heard, what is it, like 100 micrograms or something of, of uh, al- aluminum with the vitamin K shot given to infants. I mean, that seems like something that should be discussed. And yeah, and also like, you know, also, you know, I've, I've talked about some of the detrimental harm of aluminium and, and so like putting that straight into tissue and into the bloodstream and especially when it comes to the brain. But also just look at the vitamin K shot. Yeah, okay. Like I, I can touch on that one. Yeah, okay. So what helps with your ability to absorb vitamin K? E. coli, Escherichia coli. Yeah, okay. So why was this never like a huge issue? Previously, so if I've actually got low levels of Escherichia coli, so I've got once again gastrointestinal, so microbiome ratio issues and so forth. Well, Escherichia coli gets a bit of a bad rap. So most of the time, if I said to people um, E. coli, they would associate that that with bad bacteria. Yeah, okay. Now you've got six strains of pathogenic Escherichia coli, but that doesn't. The majority of the E. coli in the body is good. Yeah. So for instance, your hemoglobin is dependent on Escherichia coli. Dependent on E. coli, yeah, okay, your your hemoglobin. So it's transporting oxygen around the body, yeah, okay? Because Escherichia coli helps you metabolize glycine. Glycine is the building block for heme, heme, hemoglobin. Yeah, okay? So Escherichia coli also there's there's high instances of osteopenia and osteoporosis with low Escherichia coli. Okay. Mm. Why? 
because estrogen cola helps you absorb vitamin K. Mm. Yeah, okay. So you understand because we can be passing down what these microbiome imbalances. Okay, we're through pass- breast milk through well, also w- also what you what you acquire through the, through the, through the uterus. Yeah. yeah okay. Now, oh, yeah. and and then some babies aren't even going through the uterus. Yeah. It's like like C section. Okay, so they're not getting exposed, and also just because it, the the baby goes through the uterus doesn't mean like passes through the uterus wall doesn't mean it's getting good microbiome ratio, because the reality is based on what I'm saying that essentially the, the 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 woman could already have microbiome imbalances and actually have more pathogenic bacteria have more things like candida and yeast and so essentially where do you think she's passing that down to the kid to the baby yeah okay and then basically if there's poor microbiome balance yeah, okay well if, if that if there's issues with things like estrochea coli that's definitely going to cause problems with things like vitamin k now if the woman has got the estrochea coli issues in terms of not having enough well, she's not absorbing enough vitamin K. Now, do you think, you know, um, she's passing that, um, you know, through the placenta and, you know, through the, uh, through to the baby? But no one's, almost nobody thinks about this. Like w- women and men who, who decide to have a child. I mean, you do. A, guy, a, g- a woman like Rhonda Patrick does. You guys go above and beyond to make sure the health of your child is optimal because you're bringing a life into a world and they don't get a choice. Yeah. Right? So you're trying to help them uh, start with a better advantage. But how do we how do we broach that conversation to make this more important for people? Because people just pop on our babies left and right. They don't. It just happens. Yeah. Well, that, that, and that's the thing. Like even what I'm talking about with, um, you know, with things like intestinal permeability. Well, nowadays there is a genetic predisposition for intestinal permeability. Oh, great. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> now just add it to the list. Well, God damn. Now, it. now, why would there be a genetic predisposition? Because we're seeing now a higher instance of people with complications like intestinal permeability now if they've got those those complications where do you think they're passing mm. the genetic predisposition down to okay it's it's like people like people need to really really understand so there's a, there's a genetic predisposition you're also passing down the microbiome ratio issues that you have yeah okay um you know if if like if you like in the instance with a with a female if she doesn't have you know enough estrogen coli then that's affected like a key micronutrient like vitamin k yeah okay and that's what obviously leads to uh, toddlers having to have vitamin k injections because they didn't receive these micronutrients hmm. you know um through the placenta does that make sense yeah okay so they, they weren't receiving these micronutrients because where do you think the, the the infant is getting the micronutrients from it's getting it from the mother, yeah, okay? And so if we don't correct these problems, what do we think is going to essentially happen to um, uh, uh, toddlers and so forth, yeah, okay? And so the thing is, it's really important to understand also that, um, and I talk about this, this, this connection often, yeah, okay? When it comes to like, let's say emotional development, yeah, okay? The key years for emotional development are between the ages of zero and three, Okay? That's just one fact. I'm not going to dive into that deeper. Yeah, okay. Your microbiome, okay, uh, basically develops in the first thousand days. Zero to three. Th- three years. Yeah, okay. Your gastrointestinal lining develops by the age of three, and your immune system develops by the age of three, and so basically all of these things are interconnected. Was that a lot yeah. of pressure for you and your wife? to really try and do everything right? Like, because that can be overwhelming feeling. Did, how did you guys manage that? Yeah, I mean, like, so, so a big thing for us before um, getting pregnant with Brea is that we did all the testing, yeah, okay? So we tested what was going on with our gastrointestinal lining, yeah, okay? We test what microbiome um, ratio issues we had. We we tested what was going on with the, the gut lining, yeah, okay? And we, we both went through gut protocols before conceiving to make sure that we actually gave um, Brea the best opportunity to have, um, you know, as little problems as, as possible when she was uh, a toddler, yeah, okay? You know, and if I actually look at her development, her ability to learn and 
Uh, her vocabulary for she's two years old is like, and a lot of people are just going to say, well, you're lucky. And I just don't believe that. Okay. Like we set her up for it. Okay. Her, her ability to retain information is like phenomenal. Yeah, okay. Well, she does have you as a father, who's also <laughs> phenomenal. At but retaining. like uh, me as an infant, well, I was never like that. Yeah, really? Okay. Yeah. Oh, stop, stop, stop. Yeah. yeah. You haven't always had this incredible memory? No, it's actually something that. Come on, when stop I, lying, Dave. I'm, you, I'm, I'm, do you I'm, have some uh, type of photographic or eidetic memory? <laughs> I'm serious. Well, well actually, it's, it's n- nothing that, uh, you know, through school and. Um, I never actually thought that I had a really good memory. I actually had a, quite a poor ability to retain information. Um, I actually, you know, had a lot of health complications, like I had um, asthma and I had to have uh, three inhalers. Um, you know, I had terrible uh, hay fever, I had terrible allergies. I used to have steroidal injections for hay fever. That's how bad my hay fever used to get. Of course, I took antihistamines. It got to a point that the antihistamines, um, because they essentially can cause complications with things like DAO, like diamine oxidase, and essentially that's the enzyme that you need to help to mitigate the excess amounts of histamine. So essentially what can happen with people taking antihistamines is it can work in a particular season, but then the next season you have to take more antihistamines. So it just got to a point where I was taking so many antihistamines that it just... I didn't notice anything okay so they might have worked for one season next season i had to take more the next season i had to take more it got to a point where they weren't really doing anything yeah okay um so i used to have, have to take a lot of antihistamines um you know um because i was a big drinker when i was younger i partied pretty hard yeah okay now especially for men alcohol can have real negative effects on a like an anti-stress hormone that's called vasopressin as vasopressin is an antidiuretic hormone, yeah, okay, um, because you put way more uh, stress on vasopressin when you're drinking alcohol, yeah, okay, just for the antidiuretic sort of impact, okay. But vasopressin as a hormone actually helps with your ability to retain information, mm. yeah, okay. It actually helps with mental clarity. It actually helps with short-term to long-term memory, yeah, okay. Um, and, you know, it actually helps with your ability to learn. It actually helps with your ability to retain information easily and it's quite interesting because i was a uh, a relatively big drinker from an early age yeah okay what are we talking oh look the first time i would have drunk would have been at the age of 14 now i'm not saying that i drank regularly you know from 14 onwards but you know I, I partied pretty hard from the ages of at least 18 onwards yeah. Yeah, okay and if, if you take all these things okay because obviously if i've got you know, uh, respiratory problems, then I've got problems with the epithelium. Okay, anyone with asthma has compromised epithelium in the lungs. Now, if you think if essentially the epithelium in the lungs is essentially made up of the same connective tissue, you know, type 1 collagen we're talking about, do you think I'm going to have compromised epithelium in the small intestine and the large intestine as well? Of course. Okay, so basically having compromised epithelium, yeah, okay, um, you know, so having those ret- respiratory problems, yeah, okay, you know, having, you know, severe allergies, yeah, okay, well, then that was definitely signs of things like hyperpermeability, okay, like, um, you know, severe inflammatory issues and so forth. So that they were all signs of hyperpermeability taking place from a very, very young age. Does that make sense? Okay. So considering that particular, you know, protein molecules and you can have problems with like cryptopyrroles, HPL and these things can essentially bind to micronutrients like zinc and B6, like uh, pyridoxine, or people might know it from a supplement form, uh, P5P, pyridoxal 5-phosphate. It's a more bioavailable form of B6. But basically, the cryptopyrroles, they bind to excess amounts of B6. They bind to excess amount, uh, they, they bind to B6 and they bind to zinc and they render them non-bioavailable. Okay, and then B6 and zinc, they pair up to actually help with neurotransmitter in the uh, balance in the brain but b6 and zinc are also uh, vital for gut motility they're actually required for the epithelium because b6 actually helps your ability to assimilate hydroxyproline proline glycine arginine the amino acids that you actually need for the connective tissue and the zinc actually helps with elasticity so it helps with intestinal churning because look at zinc zinc helps with elasticity of tendons and ligaments okay so you can actually see like all, all the problems that i had okay would have 100 percent been affect affecting my brain function mm. and affecting my so Memory. but once i actually you know peel back the layers of the onion 
then I actually uncovered that, hey, I've got actually got a pretty amazing memory. And that's why for me, like I don't think like people go, oh, but he's, he's, he's just got this photographic memory. People look at you yeah, like yeah. that. He's got a photographic memory and like he's, he's just got this incredible ability to retain information. And I think everyone is like that. You really believe that? I really believe that. But there's, okay. a, sc- there's a scale, right? Like th- surely there's like, there's a spectrum of like how well you can do, but... There's a spectrum of how far you are willing to go. Mm. Well said. Yeah. So okay. that's, that's where the spectrum lies. So what okay. do you attribute... How, f- how far are you willing to, to go and what, how, how much are you willing to sacrifice? Okay. So I was like, I'm at a point where I'm, I was willing to let go of a lot of the things that were holding me back. Okay. So I was willing to let go of alcohol and parting hard. I was willing to let go of that and to the extent of willing to let go of particular, um, you know, uh, social groups. Okay. Um, I was willing to, um, compromise short-term gratification through things like sugar and whether that might be alcohol or you know things that would give me that short-term gratification of feeling good for a short period of time yeah okay i was willing to put my uh, my body through you know short-term pain okay whether that be things like ice therapy yeah okay um because i knew um having making these sacrifices and also putting my body through this short-term pain that i was going to get this long-term gain out of it okay so that's that if you ask me truly alex that's really what can separate me from a lot of other people is that i'm willing to make those sacrifices i'm willing to basically adopt all these different aspects that are going to allow me to uncover what i'm truly capable of because to 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 meditate every day yeah okay to breathe every day to do ice therapy on a regular basis to move regularly yeah okay to eat clean every day okay requires a lot of discipline and it requires a lot of sacrifices okay but if someone is willing to make those sacrifices and adopt as many of these these disciplines as possible they also are capable of uncovering aspects of themselves that they never thought was possible. You're totally right. Yeah. You're absolutely right because it's a choice. It's a tough choice. It's a difficult choice because you have to get over that, that feedback loop of gratification, whether it be drugs or alcohol or food. And you have to, the hardest thing you'll do is getting through those addictions. But on the other side is the absolute best version of yourself like i'm sitting in front of you right now like people look at you and i think you're aware of it but it's very i guess i don't know how it feels for you but people look at you like this superhuman type of guy with memory with success in business with expertise with family with just the way you carry yourself um but you chose that yeah that was all decisions the one one thing like my my partner bianca always says to me she says you're like a you're like a good bottle of wine okay (laughs) and and she said you get you you get better and better with 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 age yeah yeah? and when i say to people I, i i feel better at 44 than i did when i was 20 i mean it you know, I'm not. I'm. I'm not pulling people's legs. Okay, um, I 100% feel better at 44 than I did when I was 20. Okay, and if I actually look at it, I've just been willing to adopt more and more as I've got older. I've been willing to go. Yeah, I'll do ice therapy. But I've been willing to say, well, I never did meditation, yeah. but now I'm going to do it. Now I'm going to do metacognition every single morning. Yeah. Okay, um, and I don't. I don't. If it's if it's going to take time out of my day. That's the sacrifice I'm going to make. Yeah, okay, but then it comes with all these these further advantages that I start to see further down the line, like my ability to retain information, like my ability to handle stress, um, also my ability to un- un- like uncover, um, like to sort of peel back the layers of like emotional stress and emotional trauma. Yeah, okay. Like um, for me to un- uncover my own emotions, yeah, okay, that's got better as I've got older. 
Okay, that's that, that's 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 the reality. Okay, but this is the expectation we should have. <laughs> this is what should happen. Exactly. But it's the opposite. As people get, we, we now like you associate with like a 40, 50, 60 year old with like they're, they're half dead. Yeah, and what they think they think that that's just the way things are meant to be. But it's okay, not. but it's not. It it a hundred percent is not. It's it it it's basically you are you are choosing to accept the status quo. Okay and you're not willing to let go of things that are no longer serving you well said absolutely i, I want to touch on uh what you're doing now like what does your supplementation look like now like in the morning like I, i've got a cornucopia of supplements that i've taken off what i've gone through protocols with you yeah what what the fuck does dave o'brien take every morning <laughs> yeah like look for me it's most of the time you know i'm in, in a bit of a maintenance regime sure. yeah, okay and at some point like i always do like a bit of a reboot for the for the gut and i mean you know i've created a you know, it's it's called the gut repair, and the gut repairs is a nine week, fifteen week version, and I'm going to do it myself. Okay, is this available online for people? Yeah, it is actually. I didn't yeah, know that. Okay. Where can people go to get that? Yeah, so you can actually go to the um, www.daveobrien.com. Yeah, okay, oh. you can get it from the Fifth Element website as well. Yeah, okay, um, but it, it is available. It's, I've, I've done a bit of a soft la launch with it, but now like I want to get it out to the masses. And what it's really designed to do is a bit of a reboot for the gut, okay? Because you know it, and you've been through it. Most people need to go, go through an individual, uh, like a like an individual approach, yeah. okay? Because the one thing I want to stress with the gut repair, if you've got things like parasites, yeah, okay, it's not going to fix the parasites, yeah, okay? Um, if you've got things like SIBO, it's not going to fix the SIBO. Is it, is it going to help to uh, make you feel better with those types of things yes okay but really what it's designed on fixing is the epithelium it's really designed on helping to fix the mucosal cells okay um, so that you, you've got better structure there okay and that in turn is going to help with the microbiome balance and some of the opportunistic and um, bacteria that you may have acquired over time and so forth but I want to stress that it's not going to fix Good. a lot of those more complex because you're most likely going to have to go into a, uh, a more individualized approach to that and that's one thing I really want to stress and you know once you've done that then doing like this little bit of a reboot for the gut is something you should do 100 percent once a year like periodically yes That's great yeah, okay into that. yeah and so there's a nine week version 15 week look what would i prefer people to do always the longer time frame yeah okay give the gut what it deserves and what it deserves is a longer time period of healing yeah okay you know if you look at it a lot of people are going to say based on science that you know that the epithelium have the ability to replenish themselves in like um you know five to ten days yeah. just understand a lot of the time they're doing this research in a petri dish and so forth and yes the enterocytes can re repair and can recover extremely quickly okay i would say that's more in a natural environment now if you go off the grid you get into forest and you know where there's waterfalls and streams and in that environment, the epithelium, because you're being exposed to microbes and all these types of things from the soil and that, has the ability to re repair itself, they could say, up in, in as short a time period of three days. Yeah, that's okay? crazy. But that's not an environment that everyone is in, yeah, okay? And the actual, the the if you look at the, the villi and the ability for things like the enterocytes, which, you know, if you look at the villi a little bit, uh, closer to the surface of the villi, yeah, okay, and their ability, their 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 main function is to release enzymes to help you to break down macromolecules like um, uh, amino acids and lipids and glucose molecules, yeah, okay. But they basically say that they have the ability to repair within five to ten days, but also their ability to repair repair is dependent on other epithelium and other mucosal cells okay so those mucosal cells are called progenitor cells and they're they're located more towards the base of the intestinal crypt or more towards the base of the villi okay now what happens if they're damaged so the ability for the epithelium to because um, they help with the replenishment of the epithelium further up the the villi yeah, okay but if they're damaged, then that compromises your ability to repair the other epithelium. Does that make sense? Okay, which means the epithelium in the villi stays damaged. Okay, 
do you understand what I'm saying here? Yeah, okay. So it's not, it's just not as simple. And so sometimes it can take your gut lining as long as two and a half to three years to fully repair. But do you know how okay. much that freaks people out? Like yeah. people, you think, people, ugh, yes, they'll, some will do it, but shit, that's such an overwhelming thing for people to come to, come to terms with. Yeah, and then look, there's, there's, definitely new, there's, there's definitely new things, especially when it comes to the world of peptides and so forth. Yeah. And you, you probably heard of BPC-157, yep. you know, and obviously they use it with athletes. Have you used that? I'm not, I'm not, you know, I've, I've done a lot of research on it now and I'm definitely not anti it. And I think used in the right way can have some huge, huge advantages to the gastrointestinal lining. Yeah, okay. So obviously you can take it orally, you can take it in capsules, you can take an injectable, which yeah. is, um, is, is from the research a lot more beneficial to take an injectable. Yeah, okay. And obviously in the athletic, athletic realms is they inject it into tendons and ligaments to actually, because we're dealing with connective tissue would so and obviously the the gut lining is is connective tissue yeah okay it's smooth muscle yeah so okay? peptides could be a treatment option in healing yeah and so well, one thing that i would like so i'm not anti i'm not anti it yeah okay the one thing that i want to say potentially using these things so like doing like a gut repair yeah okay like like um like what, what i'm talking about the nine week or the 15 week version yeah, okay post that would be the opportunity uh, to use something like mm. BPC-157 because you've got a little bit of like a blank canvas. Okay, so what's happening is people are using things like BPC-157. They've got all these bacterial issues. Okay, and then ultimately because the BPC, yes, it's going to help with the gut lining, but where it can be debatable, is it really going to realign the microbiome imbalances and so forth that you've got? Okay, and so the problem is, is that the the, the bacterial byproducts that the bacteria is releasing is causing more damage to the epithelium so things like lps like lipopolysaccharides acetaldehyde okay you know uh, nitric oxide like inducible nitric oxide so these byproducts they're causing more damage to the gut lining so if i don't alleviate that stress okay that's going to take away from the effectiveness of the of the peptide the bpc 157 okay but if i actually go through a healing you know mitigate the inflammatory load taking place sure. in the gastrointestinal lining using things like curcumin to do that because it actually helps with the repair of the gi epithelial tissue and actually mitigates the oxidative stress taking place in the gastrointestinal lining using things like boswellia which is myrrh or frankincense okay well that helps with vascular permeability it it, it, it actually helps to inhibit uh, chemotaxis which is the migration of bacteria in the gastrointestinal lining okay um, it inhibits uh, hle which is human leukocyte elastase which is responsible for respiratory distress if it's causing respiratory distress it's causing issues with the you know the epithelium in the lung so of course it's going to help with the epithelium in the other in the small intestine the large intestine so that's why i'm all for like a step-by-step -step process yeah. does that make sense where i mitigate the inflammatory load that's going to actually help also with adipose cells or adipocytes because you've got pro-inflammatory protein receptors on your on your fat cells so that's why a lot of people when they go through like a, a leaky gut protocol they actually notice improvements in body composition getting leaner because they're re reducing the inflammatory load does that make sense yeah okay so and using other things to actually help with you know the the mucosal cells so things like uh, goat's colostrum okay because goat's cl colostrum excuse me uk helps with things like proline peptides proline peptides help with the epithelium it helps with immunoglobulins so it helps with trigger mechanisms so immune system so that's why i'm all for like a step-by-step -step process but also you know in the in the gut repairs like a, a, a small antimicrobial section which is based on basically what i see what antimicrobials work from a sensitivity perspective for the higher majority of bacteria, which is things like grapefruit seed extract. Yeah. A lot of people are gonna say, well, that causes some problems with the microbiome. I'm not gonna dispute that. Does yes, it? it does, yeah, okay, because it's an antimicrobial, so it can wipe out your good bacteria, just as can oregano oil and so forth, yeah, okay? So, um, but once again, there's we're only doing this for like a, a short period of time and we're using like a rotational method, sure. using that with Uva Ursi and then using it with a biofilm agent. And then post that, we're just doing more repair on the gut lining. Now, post doing that, that would be the, the perfect opportunity to use a peptide like BPC-157, yeah, okay? Because it's like a blank canvas and then the ability for the BPC is like seal and heal on the gut lining. I'm all like I would be very pro that. 
Does that make sense? Where would yeah. you? Do you know where to get it? Well, who? What organizations in Melbourne do that? Well, actually, I, I think one of the, the the major labs is actually within Melbourne. Yeah. Okay. Um, really. Yep. Oh. Yep. So. Um, you know, and you can get the oral tablets, yeah, okay? But once again, some people saying that the oral tablets might work better because obviously you're taking it orally and then it hits the gut lining, hmm. okay? Um, if it doesn't get broken down by stomach acid. Yeah, that's the thing, yeah, okay? So it, it's not 100% known which one may be more effective, okay? I would say more so research says that injectable is a little bit more effective at the moment, but once again, who knows, hmm. yeah, okay? So there are additional things, you know, you look at uh, people like Ben Greenfield is a big advocate yeah. of BPC-157. So, you know, and there's there's more research coming out to show the, the benefits. But I would still, you, you understand, you need to mitigate the inflammatory load. You need to realign the microbiome. You, you can't, like, the problem is because people went through this phase of even things like fecal transplants, you know, okay, where it's a little bit like putting fertilizer over the top of the grass where you want to get fertilizer in the soil and it's a little bit like that with the bpc as well like we want to mitigate the 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 microbiome imbalances we want to mitigate the bacterial byproducts that are causing more damage to the gut lining once we do that we can use the the bpc like yeah. get the get the actual uh uh you know the the amino acids and the and the the nutrients that w that we need to get into the soil does that make sense get them into the cell to help to repair like seal and heal the cell. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay. So um, I'm, not, I'm definitely not anti those types of things. But once again, people need to understand when is the right time, when is the right time to use those things. And there, there's, there's particular things that you can do and then utilizing it where it's going to be more effective rather than just using it and you've got all these other complications that ultimately need to be fixed. Right. It's like, yeah, okay. it's like put, trying to put a Band-Aid on like a giant wound. Yeah, well, that's that's why the, you know, the fecal transplants were so hit and miss, yeah, okay? Because if you just had microbiome imbalances, so you just didn't have enough good bacteria, then of course it's going to work, okay? But what happens if you've got an overgrowth of negative gram bacteria or opportunistic bacteria? Well, you know, it's, it's not going to fix that problem. So that problem is still going to exist. So you might have felt you know uh, good for about a week or two weeks but then all of a sudden you feel like death again mm. yeah, okay because ultimately you haven't got rid of the uh, the problem that needs to get rid of and ultimately you, you haven't also healed the gut lining that's the reason you've probably got the microbiome in, not probably that's the reason you've got the microbiome imbalances in the first place anyway does that make sense yeah okay <laughs> So, you know, if people think that BPC-157, just taking that is going gonna, is, is gonna to solve all your problems. I mean, it's going to help, It's right? going to help, yeah, okay? It's, but once again, it's just like, it, it's, there's, my whole thing is, there's not a monotherapy. Yes. Yeah, okay? Explain what you mean by that. Well, the, the whole thing. I had to look that word up the first time you said it. <laughs> what the fuck do you mean? Yeah, because a lot of the time, like, what we're trying to do is, like we might have a hormonal imbalance, yeah, okay? And if we've got a hormonal imbalance, we might um, use HRT, hormone replacement yeah. therapy, yeah, okay? Um, you know, even if I potentially use the examples of like Eastern, dominant, uh, Eastern dominance issues, and that might be things like endometriosis, you know, um, complications with like polycystic ovaries, yeah, okay? Well, let's use endometriosis as an example, okay, which is definitely a, a woman's health complication coming about from Eastern dominance, yeah, okay? Well, what we're, what we're essentially always trying to do is, is, is deal with the hormonal issue, yeah, okay? Now, yes, it's a hormonal issue, but let's understand why yeah. did that hormonal issue actually eventuate yeah okay and actually you look at something like endometriosis okay what actually you can link it to problems with what's a group of bacteria called the estrobolum the estrobolum is made up of 60 different types of bacteria yeah okay and the role of the estrobolum which is made up of enteric bacteria and it's made up of bacteria like Escherichia coli it can actually be made up of pathogenic strains of bacteria like shigella which is a negative gram bacteria and basically the these uh, the bacteria actually produce um, beta-glucuronidase, which is an enzyme. And the role of the beta-glucuronidase is to basically separate bound estrogen. Okay, so it separates the estrogen, so it's unbound, so you've got, and then recirculate the estrogen through the bloodstream, so you've got more estrogen. Yeah, okay, so if I've got an overgrowth of this particular type of bacteria, so I've got an overgrowth of Escherichia coli, which I would see in the instance of SIBO, 
small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, yeah, okay? Um, then you're producing higher amounts of beta-glucuronidase, which means basically you're, you're unbinding the estrogen so you have more active estrogen in your bloodstream. Okay, now if I've got more ac active estrogen in my bloodstream, well, yes, the estrogen will play on the estrogen receptors on your adip adipocytes or your adipose cells, okay? But also I'm just gonna have more estrogen circulating around the bloodstream, okay? If I've got more estrogen circulat circulating around the bloodstream, well, estrogen causes tissue growth. Mm. okay now what would be an example of tissue growth because like with endometriosis you can have that tissue growth on the, on the, uh, so on the, the out, outer side of the uterus but you can have it on the inner side of the uterus but you also can have that tissue growth in the intest in the gastrointestinal lining as well okay so my point being is that's yes the the the, the issue is the estrogen dominance but my point of being bringing up the SIBO and the beta glucuronidase and the estrobolum scenarios, what actually caused the yeah. estrogen? That's always the question. Yeah. What caused the problem? And so it's actually was the complications with the small intestinal bacterial overgrowth and the higher concentration of you know particular bacteria, maybe like Shigella or Escherichia coli, causing higher release of beta glucuronidase that was basically causing high amounts of active estrogen to be circulated around your bloodstream. Okay. So, so to correct the hormonal issue, what do I have to correct? The bacterial issue. I have to correct the SIBO. I have to correct what's going on in the gut lining. Me just going like, like we're going to try and treat this through some sort of like, you know, estrogen clearers or like is if I haven't actually corrected the problem where this starts from, using estrogen clearers, is that going to correct the SIBO and the gastrointestinal lining issue? No. Okay, just like there's a good chance you taking hormone replace, replacement therapy, okay, is not going to correct your hormonal issues. For, for a moment in time, it's going to make you feel better because yeah. there is a hormonal issue, but you're going to have to address the issues that cause the hormonal imbalance. Which for you and for, for, for health always seems to come down to the gut. I know you say you're not like, I know you say like, oh, not everything's about the gut. Well, guess what? Everything seems to be about the gut. Well, if you look at neurotransmitters and you look at hormones, like one of the biggest modulators of estrogen, let's, once again, let's use that as an example, is your gut lining, is your microbiome. Yep. Okay. I'll just use one example of that, lactobacillus. Okay, it's a carrier for estrogen, so it helps to recirculate it through the bloodstream. So it's a modulator, it's a regulator. Okay, what happens if I've got low levels of lactobacillus? It's going to be a problem for estrogen. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay. You know, uh, other hormones like progesterone really depend on your microbiome balance. Yeah, okay. Now, my ability to assimilate the singular molecules that are the building blocks for things like neurotransmitters and hormones, okay, comes from your microbiome. So like if I give you an example, okay, so um, lactobacillus, okay, if, it's a mo if it actually helps with estrogen, well, estrogen helps with the metabolization of L-tryptophan. L-tryptophan is a, a, yeah. So L-tryptophan gets converted into 5-hydroxy-L-tryptophan, gets converted to serotonin, gets converted to melatonin. Yeah. Okay, so but where does it all start from? It started from the lactobacillus. Fucking gut. Yeah, okay. God damn it. Yeah, okay. And so if I don't have you know, the right microbiome to allow me to assimilate and actually help with things like L-tryptophan, okay? Well, L-tryptophan can get converted into other compounds, okay? So instead of getting converted into the 5-hydroxy-L-tryptophan, it can get converted into indole. And indole is a byproduct from, um, it's a chemical byproduct from uh, microbiome um, uh, fermentation, yeah, okay? And so basically, indole in high amounts because once again, if you don't have the right type of microbiome, okay, to help with that protein fermentation, okay, then basically you end up converting more into the indole. Indole causes insulin resistance. Hmm. Another example of that would be, um, you know, uh, tyrosine. So if I don't have the, the right microbiome to help me with the assim assimilation of tyrosine, and obviously the tyrosine, tyrosine should be get, getting converted into L-DOPA, dopamine and then help with things like norepinephrine like your catecholamines and epinephrine yeah okay then you end up converting the tyrosine into a thing another chemical compound called p cresol p cresol causes insulin resistance so if you don't actually have the right microbiome ratio then it can cause you to interact with um 
you know, food molecules and protein molecules in a completely different way. And you can end up converting them more into other chemical compounds that can have a negative impact on the body. And what you can draw conclusions on is you can start blaming food mm -hmm. Demonized food for, groups. once again, like the insulin resistance where really the problem was the, the, the microbiome imbalances. Mm. And we see that in things like, you know, if you've got an overgrowth of enterobacter, which is a negative gram bacteria, well, the enterobacter can cause you to convert like vitamin B4, which is choline. You end up converting the vitamin, the, the, the B4, the choline, instead of converting into something like acetylcholine, which helps with short-term to long-term memory. Okay, it helps with the, the vagus nerve. It's, you know, it's uh, the major compound that helps with the vagus nerve, so parasympathetic nervous system. Okay, um, helps with muscle contraction. It's also excitatory neurotransmitter in the brain but it's inhibitory in the cardiovascular system so it lowers blood pressure lowers resting heart rate yeah okay so instead of converting into that you end up converting the choline into tmao which is trimethylamine n oxide okay and that's that's basically atherosclerosis in in small amounts of tmao is not a problem it actually has benefits to um a blood pressure and so forth but in high amounts yeah okay it basically causes atherosclerosis, which is like plaquing, so cardiovascular disease, yeah, okay? And so, you know, where can you get high amounts of choline? You can get it from, uh, you know, seafood and, you know, eggs, so duck eggs and chicken eggs. So you can make the conclusion, if you did some sort of research, okay, that chicken eggs and duck eggs and seafood cause plaquing, cause atherosclerosis. But my argument would be, did they cause it? Or did the enterobacter actually cause the, the plaquing? But most research studies aren't controlling for Well, that's the problem. And, the so, and so one, one of my big issues that I have with research, especially when it comes to nutrition, okay, is if you're not testing what's going on in that individual's gut lining and you're not testing their microbiome, then you, you haven't created the right platform for research. Then most of the new research <laughs> in nutrition well, that's where a lot put of the, in the bin. That, and that's where a lot of the flaws in research are. It's so tough. It's yeah. so tough to do nutrition research really well. Yeah. It is, it is it, one, because we, you know, that's going to take a lot of time and effort. Money. But you understand, to really understand how people are interacting with things. Yeah, you've got to understand you, it. You, you, have to, you have to test the area that enables us to interact with the food properly. That is your microbiome and your gut line. Like, unless someone knows something that I, that, that I don't, which is that the gut lining doesn't interact with your food, okay <laughs> then yeah i'm open i'm, yeah. I'm open to try but, and understand but it's it's factual that it does yeah okay yeah. and so if that is broken do you think this could negatively affect how we convert things For into sure. particular compounds and could it negatively affect how we convert things where we're converting it into more compounds that have a detrimental uh, effect on our health of course Okay, we like, and that's why, like, I, I think, you know, with research, Alex, yeah, okay, it's a little bit like watching a dog chase its tail. And what, what, do, you, what do you mean by that? Well, it's just the dog just goes around in circles, yeah, okay, because you understand, as entertaining as that is, yeah, okay, it's because we don't create the right platforms to really understand how people are interacting with food, yeah, okay, and that's why people can, you know, notice that people might be getting more things like atherosclerosis and plaquing from higher consumption of eggs and and seafood but once again the microbiome has completely changed the platform mm. okay so what happens if we we you know half that group had an overgrowth of enterobacter well now that just makes that research completely irrelevant from the yeah. gut perspective yeah <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah I'm just saying tough. when it, I'm just saying when it comes to nutrition, yeah, okay, like you, you know all the things that I talked about with you know carnivore and you know vegan, yeah, yeah. okay. Now, what happens if we haven't tested you know people with like hydrochloric acid issues and so forth? Like once again, it's just completely changing how they're interacting with food. But the problem is there's endless there's endless things to test for, right? Mm. But you're saying let's do the gut. At least let's do the gut. Let's do the gut line. Let's do the microbiome. Like create a better platform For to understand sure. how people are interacting with food. Absolutely. Yeah. Like it's just, as I said, the, the gut lining is definitely forcing us into these extreme nutrition regimes. Yeah. yeah okay. For the, sure. Like for me, there's no doubt about it. Yeah. Okay. All I'm saying is 
let's create a better platform. Okay, so one, and when we do research, let's test what's going on there. But also, let's just fix it. Let's just fix, let's, let's fix this connective tissue. Let's fix this smooth muscle. Let's create a better platform. Once we create a better platform, okay, then we really know um, how people interact with food. We know what's going to work better for them. Okay, we're going to help. We're going to have a cascade effect on neurotransmitter balance. We're going to have a cascade effect on hormonal balance. Then there may actually be things like, and I don't dispute this, there may actually be genetic mutations and so forth that are creating other problems. But at least let's fix the area that's having the biggest cascade effect on the body. The, the analogy I always bring up with people is the waterfall analogy. Okay, And the waterfall analogy is if I had a waterfall and that waterfall wasn't flowing properly, and I said, Alex, I want you to find out why this waterfall is not flowing properly. What part of the waterfall would you go to? You go to the motherfucking top. <laughs> Everyone is going to go to the top. Yeah. I'm telling you. But yeah, we don't okay? do that with the human body. Yeah, and the top is food. And so if we, if we want to really, you know, shorten the debate on food, yeah, okay? The problem with food is the quality of food. That's where the real problem lies. Rather than yeah. what you eat, it's more about the quality is what you're it's saying? It's the quality that we've interfered with it, that it's genetically modified, we've changed the structure, it's been exposed to herbicides and pesticides. You expose fruit to you know, insecticides and pesticides. Well, a lot of the phytonutrients, so things like anthocyanins, which you know, immunostimulants, you know, which you find in purple colored fruits. Yeah, okay. Like these phytonutrients, they're part of the, the, the fruit's immune system. So as soon as you spray it with insecticide and pesticide, what does the fruit not need to produce? The phytonutrients. Okay? And so just because something's meant to have those phytonutrients doesn't mean it does. Wait, so you're saying that uh, spraying pesticides, herbicides, fungicides on fruit and vegetables down-regulates the phytonutrient content in it? Yeah, because they're, they're, they're part of the, the, the fruit and the plant's immune system. So it doesn't need to produce as many of the phytonutrients to try and fight off the... The, the the bugs and the insects and so forth yeah okay, okay. so you can be eating something you go it's really really high in anthocyanins or you know like like carotenoids or whatever that might be yeah okay but the 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 process that it's going through negatively affects its nutrient okay. density does that make sense but yeah, practically okay. speaking this means well this is the case for organic or locally sourced farm exactly so fruit. when people go like well meat is the devil yeah okay and i just go well poor quality meat is bad yeah, like, factory let, farming yeah yeah that should Let's, exist. i don't want to i don't even want to have like a podcast or a debate about it because i'm not going to dispute the person yeah okay when they're going like you know yeah factory farming and all that the you know and and cattle that's consume you know grain that has glyphosate sure. yeah okay then then of course it, and you know it's got herbicides and pesticides and obviously the the animal is storing the you know the the toxins in their fat cells of course that fat is going to be bad for you like I'm, i don't want to even get into a debate about that because i'm not going to debate you mm. okay because i'm going to say yes mm -hmm. okay but why do we think there's no issues like this with fruits and vegetables That's a great point. of course there's yeah. issues with fruits and vegetables like this yeah okay they're a problem it poor quality fruits and vegetables could they cause serious health complications? There's no doubt about it. Yeah, okay. Um, you know, poor quality dairy. The fact of the matter is some people do exceptionally well on dairy. Yeah, okay. There's an ancestral aspect there, okay. You know, especially things like sheep's products and goat's products where the enzymes are recognized a little bit better. Yeah, okay. Lower um, lactose. Yeah, uh, yeah it's, it's, it's got lo uh, lower lactose, but you also get a lot of things like proline peptides, immunoglobulins, really high in selenium. Yep. Yeah, okay. Um, you know, a lot of people think, well, you know, um, Brazil nuts are really high in selenium. I go, yeah, they're meant to be, but actually more animal proteins are probably higher in selenium. Yeah, mm -hmm. okay. I'm not disputing that Brazil nuts should be high in selenium, but let's just talk about reality. We're talking about that's a perfect scenario based on the soil being rich in selenium. The soil's not rich in selenium. Guess what? The Brazil nuts are not high in selenium. Yeah, okay? So a lot of these goats and sheep's products is really high in, um, 
selenium, omega-3 fatty acids, zinc, yeah, okay? Um, you get things like glucose lingo lipids, which actually help with gastrointestinal infections, it flies in the face of what they say about dairy, okay? You know, you look at things like uh, like butter is, you know, it's negligent, the amount of lactose in there, okay? It's got Wolzen factor, it drives calcium into your bones. Like, so I don't even know why people think, you know, dairy is essentially bad for you. Poor quality dairy is bad for like, you. Okay, you know, okay? Let's clarify so, what like that is. So like pasteurized dairy, yes, yeah, yes, okay? Yeah. Because pasteurized dairy, you know, let's just talk about complications like SIBO, yeah, okay? Well, pasteurized dairy does not contain lactase, yep. okay? Now, <laughs> just let's understand like, you know, raw milk, raw cream, yeah, okay? Th- this contains lactase, which means it doesn't sit and ferment in your gut. Okay, and if it sits there and ferments, we're talking about glucose molecules here. Okay, if it sits there and ferments in your gut, it's going to encourage what? Bacterial overgrowth. SIBO. It's SIBO. Yeah, okay, so, so the, the, real, the, the real debate that we should start to actually um, have is how do we clean up yeah. food? Even when it comes to like wheat, let's start, let's like, I don't, the gliden issue, I don't have a huge issue with, yeah, okay? If it's actually if it's coming from gut. better sources and it's a healthy gut yeah. and it's coming from a better source. Like a sourdough and rye. Like a sourdough, which is really good quality sourdough is really high high in lactobacillus. Yeah, okay. You know, and, and, and triticum durum wheat where the, the gliding concentration is very low. Yeah, okay. You know, um, going through the proper fermentation process. Yeah, okay. So that's the debate that we should should be having is like how do we clean up food? Not pick one food group and say that is the culprit for all our hardship. Like that is ludicrous, yeah, okay? Um, because it's all the industries that are a problem. Mm-hmm. Let's clean them all up. Let's clean up food first. Mm-hmm. And while we're doing that, let's clean what's going up, going on in the gut. Yep. Because without cleaning up what's going on in the gut, you're, you're not going to interact with the food that you're putting in your body well. And we go back to the, that waterfall analogy, okay? The top of the waterfall is the quality of your food that you're putting in your body. That's, that's why I wanted to go into that realms of the quality of the food that you're putting in your body, okay? Then the middle of the waterfall, so this is the flow, yeah? Okay? That is assimilation. That's your ability to take that food and break it down into the singular molecules and so these things get synthesized in the liver and gives you building blocks for other compounds and other functions in the human body okay so which area in the body is the filing cabinet cabinet and which area of the body has to take these molecules and break them down into the singular molecules that we use for building blocks that's the gastrointestinal lining that's the gut okay the whitewash at the bottom is the byproducts that's protein molecules, that's things like cytokines, so like, like pro-inflammatory proteins, anti-inflammatory molecules like interleukins, whatever that might be, glutathione, okay? Neurotransmitters, hormones, they're the byproducts, okay? So the, the, the two major areas that I focus on first with people is the quality of the food that they're putting in their body and the area that has to assimilate that and break it down into the molecules that we need for the building blocks. And the area that we tend to be focusing on at the moment is the whitewash, is the byproducts, is like a particular pathway or a particular neurotransmitter. Take it SSRI, you know, uh, serotonin upregulator, yeah, okay? Um, But you understand, yes, in the moment in time where that issue lies within the brain, yes, it can help in that moment in time, but what caused... Mm what caused that issue because you're looking at the end consequence that's so that's what you're looking if if we're analyzing why the waterfall doesn't flow properly you're going to the end consequence of where the water meets the meets the the ground meets the bottom of the waterfall and you think you're going to find the answers in that which is madness, okay? <laughs> like, you've got to go to the top. Mm. You've got to fix what's going on in the top. Like, like you, So all you end up doing here is you go, well, I think if I um, put a rock there and, and help with this, okay, and then something goes wrong over here. Oh, yeah, let's try and fix this. or you know, And then something goes wrong over here, yeah, okay? Because you haven't addressed the two biggest problems that create the biggest cascade effect in the body. 
That's it. Super well said, Dave. I want to be respectful of your time. I've got. <laughs> are you still good to keep going? Yeah. Well, <laughs> how how long are we hit? <laughs> 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 Long time, many hours. But no, there's two last things I wanted to finish yeah, off with you. Yeah. Um, one thing was, uh, one thing you, I think has dramatically changed my ability to, to digest and assimilate that I think most people and our culture and society has been conditioned to do without ever questioning it, as it does, drinking water with meals. Can you, once I change yeah. this, just so people know, this game changer right yeah can you explain the detriments of why we shouldn't drink water with meals yeah because it's it's an interesting one yeah okay because you look up dr google yeah okay which most people would do yeah okay and they would say there's no detrimental harm from drink, drinking fluids um with your meals that's that that would be one of the most conclusive things that would come up okay a lot of science is based on perfect scenario okay and so what i mean by this okay i'll give you another example okay well your body essentially should be able to produce its own short chain fatty acids, correct? Okay, and how it does that is by the vegetable fibers and the carbohydrate molecules and basically the indigestible matter feeds the good bacteria and the good bacteria come along and then they produce the short chain fatty acids. So what Medicool basically determined from this is, well, I don't need to get the short chain fatty acids from the food source itself because that interaction takes place. 100% agree, 100% agree in a perfect scenario how can you 100 percent promise that that interaction takes place every single time now what happens if i've got microbiome ratio issues so i've got more opportunistic bacteria okay so i've got more negative gram bacteria pathogenic forms of negative gram bacteria well they come along they feed on the indigestible matter because you understand prebiotics and so forth they're not partial what to they to what they feed they go down there they just feed whatever's down there they don't go oh, excuse me i'm just here to feed the good stuff yeah, okay so they feed on the indigestible matter and guess what they don't produce any short chain fatty acids and they just release more bacterial byproducts so you understand that scenario is different does, does that does that make sense what i'm saying okay so in the instance okay where does water come well, into it yes well i'm just going to use it because i'm using it as an example because mm. everything is based on perfect scenario the world is not a perfect scenario and many people have underlying complications. They do not interact with things well, okay? So producing hydrochloric acid, remember I already talked about it, it's like uh, you need a soup. What happens if you're missing some of the key ingredients for the soup, yeah, okay? Now, the, the whole thing is when you're drinking fluids with your meals, you have to basically pump out more hydrochloric acid, okay? That's like, so... Your body can do that. Does that make sense? I'm not going to dispute that. There's nothing wrong. Your body can pump out more hydrochloric acid to help to break down the, 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 the protein and so forth. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay. So I'm not disputing that. But what happens if you've already got a poor yeah. ability to produce hydrochloric acid? That's an issue. That's yeah. common. Yeah, it's really common, especially with people with energy is issues. So energy system issues, highly stressed, like shallow breathers. Okay, because remember I said one of the key ingredients you need is bicarbonate. Yeah. Okay, so if you're missing these ingredients and then you're eating too many omega sixes, well, that takes care of vitamin E. If you've got like uh, negative gram bacteria issues, yeast and candida issues, then that takes care of zinc. Yeah, okay, so you don't really have a good ability to produce hydrochloric acid. Okay, so if I'm putting more burden on my hydrochloric acid while I'm drinking water, okay, then because to produce hydrochloric acid is one of the most metabolically demanding processes in the human body. Why? Because it's so dependent on your energy systems. It's your dependent on your ability to get more oxygen into the mitochondria. That's why it's so energy demanding. Does that make sense? So if I'm drinking more fluids, I'm basically putting more demand on that process. So it can do it, but there's more demand on it. Does that make sense? Okay. So how can I alleviate some of that demand? Or just don't drink fluids whilst I'm trying to break down my food. Does that make sense? It's all right. Yeah. Okay. You don't. You, you don't have to drink fluids with your. Yeah. You know, with your food. Does that make sense? So the way I can do it is have separation. Yeah. Okay. So you know, at least like I always put on a timer. Okay. Because of because what? if we're highly stressed and so forth, we are putting more demand on hydrochloric acid production. This, that's just fact. Okay, we can't equate to perfect scenario, as in the body can do it. Yes, the body can do it, but we're highly stressed and we've got all these other problems and it, that's making it harder. 
What's so your time I, I you put pre-post? Uh, generally 10 minutes either side. Okay, that's reasonable. Yeah, it's, but yeah. there's one thing that hasn't been mentioned yet, and that's pH. It, this is applies to everybody. Yeah. pH of, of stomach acid when food is in the stomach and it's being broken down into, to, into chyme is about two, right? Water is about seven. Yeah. So we're already changing the acidity that's going to affect the ability to break down yeah. Yeah, these macromolecules. It, it's, you want a more acidic in, environment in the stomach when you're trying to break down uh, protein, when you're right. trying to break... So but what's going to affect one, that? But also, yeah, but one thing that the pH is not the is not the is not probably the big thing because the body can pump out more hydrochloric acid, okay, to deal with that. So it can do that. It just makes it a little bit harder though. It, it just puts more burden on it. Right. Does that make sense? So what we're trying to do here, Alex, really is alleviate the burden. Right. Does that make sense? Because once again, in perfect scenario, it can do it. Okay, I'm glad if, you clarified that. If the that. perfect scenario does not exist for the individual, yeah. okay, because cool. they're a shallow breather, they're highly stressed, they consume t too much linoleic acid, whatever that might be, then now it's going to overburden it. Got and it. I don't want to overburden it more by drinking truckloads of water while I'm trying to yep. consume more um, protein or whatever, whatever the food I'm consuming. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay. Fair enough. Yep. That covers it. Yep. That's perfect. And then the probably... The, the, one of the last things I wanted to cover was uh, I'm trying to get on like super practical things because I think, Dave, you get up into so many clouds of brilliant streams of thought and knowledge. But I think what sometimes people miss is that, okay, what can I actually do with this? And so I want to bring it into snacking. And a lot of people snack in between meals. They're constantly grazing. And then you, when I heard you talk about the migrating motor complex one time and, and why you're more so against snacking. Can you explain that in that context? Yeah. So the migrating motor complex is basically the body's ability to sweep the duodenum or the small intestine clean. Yeah, okay. So that there's no like almost like debris or, or you know, food sitting there and fermenting and basically encouraging bacterial overgrowth. Yeah, okay. The MMC consists, without me getting into too much depth with all of them, yeah, okay, but the MMC uh, consists of three major players. Yeah, okay? And so one is basically um, the enteric nervous system, yeah, okay? and it's actually enteric hormones. Okay? One of those key enteric hormones is modelin. It's produced within the in the stomach and the small intestine. Yeah, okay? and, and, and modelin helps with um, gut motility, so it helps with intestinal churning. Okay? So... One is we need the enteric, the, the enteric hormones, so we need something like a modelin to kickstart that process. Yeah, okay. And so what generally stimulates modelin is fasting. Okay, so I must be going through a period of fasting to stimulate the enteric hormone being modelin. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay. So not eating. Yes. Yeah, okay. Strangely enough. Yeah, okay. <laughs> All right. So the other one is bicarbonate. The bicarbonate is released from the pancreas. Okay, and then you understand bicarbonate because it has the ability. It's it. Um, to act alkaline and acidic yeah, okay basically controls the ph balance and as bicarbonate shoots up into the stomach and it actually helps to um, regulate the ph balance in the in the stomach yeah but also in the, the small intestine it basically um, uh, decreases the acidity of the food coming in from the stomach to the small intestine yeah okay so bicarbonate is also, also like a big player in that process and the other one is bile Okay, and so bile is released from the enterocytes. Yeah, okay, um, you know, uh, the big player would be in the gallbladder. Yeah, okay, and the biliary ducts. Okay, and then we're also talking about not just bile, but obviously cholesterol is required for bile. Okay, that's a conversation for another time. Okay, but we're talking about bile salts, and bile salts when they're released into the small intestine, they act actually act as an antimicrobial. So they actually help to kill off any bacteria that may be proliferating, opportunistic bacteria that may be proliferating in the small intestine. Well, that would be things like SIFO, SIBO, yeah, okay? And then the bile actually helps with the emulsification of the fats, yeah, yeah okay? So you need that those three ingredients to actually help with the MMC, yeah, okay? And so the whole thing with the MMC, a lot of people might say that it, it kicks in about like two and a half hours, okay? And that's obviously of not eating, yeah, okay? Um, so you might have a big meal and then it takes about two, two and a half hours. There might be some research saying it's a little bit less than that. Okay, but let's roughly Transit say... Transit time is so different from individual ex to individual. Exactly. And really depends what's going on with your motility yeah. and, and your gastrointestinal lining. Yeah, okay. So let's say it's, you know, close to that two and a half hour mark. Yeah, okay. And so a good sign that the MMC is kicking in is like uh, groaning. 
Okay, and so a lot of people, you know, once again, we may have been socially conditioned to believe that groaning means that I just need to eat more food. Okay, but as soon as you're talking about stomach gut groaning, yeah, but I'm not talking about like uh, gurgling. Yeah, okay, so when the stomach is gurgling, which is more like bubbling, yeah, like that bubbling and like sitting there, that's more of a sign of like fermentation issues within the gut lining. Okay, Um, so once again, motility issues and so forth. Yeah, okay, Um, SIBO. Um, so the groaning, okay, most people are going to perceive, oh, I need to eat, okay? And so as soon as you eat, okay, you're going to override the MMC because obviously you have to digest the food that you just eaten. Like the, it's not going to go, oh, well, hang on, just that, that can't come down, okay? So you understand what you do is you negate the MMC, okay? So you stop, fr- you, you stop the, the small intestine essentially getting cleaned and basically passing the debris and the indigestible matter into the colon, into the large intestine, where it is going to deal with that indigestible matter. And essentially there it is food for the, for, for the microbiome, like the 400 different species that are there. And then obviously they feed on the indigestible matter and it helps with the short chain fatty acids once again, okay? So hence why like, you know, snacking, you're gonna break the MMC on a regular basis. Okay, like that's what you're going to do. So you're you're stopping the release of bile salts, so that antimicrobial effect. Okay, you're having a negative effect on the ability to sweep the small intestine yeah. clean. Yeah. Okay, um, and then that essentially can encourage, you know, fermentation issues, yeah. and it can encourage uh, bacterial overgrowth. So things like SIBO. So hence why I tend to go, and you know me, I tend to say to people, at least have about four hours, like have proper meals and don't snack. Yeah, okay this whole thing of snacking to regulate your blood glucose i mean like you know we have hormones to help do that yeah i mean and then actually can cause more blood sugar management dysregulation because yeah. you're you're raising your blood glucose on a more frequent basis yeah. Yeah, again you might actually find when you go to sleep okay because you've been having like these regular meals like six meals or whatever that might be more snacking and so forth that you your blood sugar levels might actually drop overnight and like you wake up and you're like you could eat eat your arm off yeah, right. okay some some people might have some orange juice or something like that to try and regulate their blood glucose it's not advisable to be doing in your sleep yeah okay so it actually causes more blood sugar management dysregulation yeah okay um where you know to like what i tend to do is go that four hour bracket that can help with also things like gluconeogenesis which is a metabolic process that we've evolved over time to help help during periods of starvation yeah okay so you know if you don't as long that that means you won't go too long without actually having some um some food which means you're not calling on cortisol to try and regulate your raise your blood glucose levels for you okay which means basically it needs to take from your amino acid pool or your nitrogen pool and it's basically going to take you know glycogenic amino acids like glutamine and alanine because they're gly- they're glycogenic which means you can use them to raise your your blood glucose levels but the problem is i need things like glutamine for my epithelium my mucosal cells you need it for for the gastrointestinal lining yeah okay um it's a key substrate for the immune system as well yeah okay um and then you need the alanine for your ability to metabolize b vitamins you need the alanine for the krebs cycle atp so you understand you're depleting key amino acids that you need for all these other functions because you're using it to try and regulate your blood glucose levels because you're not doing it mm. you know, especially like people who are highly stressed they go real long periods without eating and so forth yeah okay which means you have to call more on gluconeogenesis so if i hit and that can happen roughly at about five hour mark especially under stress okay because you look at your you know when you train your blood glucose levels take about one to two hours to drop after training okay now um when when you're relaxed and you're doing more you know stress management things and like you know more things like meditation and uh heart math and all these types of things it takes about 60 hour, 16 hours for your blood glucose levels to drop okay now under stress when i'm running around i'm using my brain a lot yeah i'm working really hard which one do you think um you know that's going to be closer to the one to two hours or is it going to be closer to the 16 hours it's going to be closer to the one to two hours so it's going to be in the realms of about five hours okay so that's why i tend to go just under that five hour bracket i go like four hours mm. yeah, okay i help with the mmc because that two and a half hour bracket but i also help with the regulation of the blood glucose levels and then around that i will use fasting okay 
Uh, that's a conversation for another time, okay? I will use the correct fasting for the right type of individual and generally for, for most people, I'm going to use fasting on their least stressful days. So that's where we're going to use calorie deficit, Yeah. okay? And that's going to help with things like brain-derived neurotrophic factor. It's going to help with the mucosa. So it'll help with the lamina propria, the gold, all the things that I've already talked about, yeah, okay? So... Um, it's just like we've got to break down a lot of this like social conditioning and yeah. you know uh, yeah. limiting beliefs and things that we were told as a child, um, but really we weren't given a you know a, like a, a good reason to actually do it. Yeah, okay. Um, and you know, as I said, like that that's what I'm trying to do with people. I'm just trying to give them the the, the information, okay, um, that. You know, like I never like to force people to do things, yeah, okay? But what we've got to do is we've got to st stop treating people like children, okay? Um, because a lot of the time what we try to do is we try to uh, spoon feed them really basic information. We, essentially, that's what we do with children. We, we, You know, we go, oh, they can't retain this information and they um it's too hard for them and i the one thing is like i use a lot of big words and so forth and um and people will go oh it's really really confusing and yeah okay i don't know what the hell he's talking what do you about say to that? yeah okay but i generally say like but there's not too many people who deal with me that don't walk away understanding how important it is to fix their gut and that's all they need to walk away from that yep. experience feeling. Okay, they don't. I don't. I, they don't need to fill out a quiz about secretory IGA at the end of the 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 the. the, the Can you imagine the, the everyone encounter, had to do a quiz yeah, okay? after every time they see you? <laughs> they don't need to talk about every single yeah. you know enzyme. Yeah, okay. Yeah. But they, the the problem is because we dumb it down so much, it doesn't really put enough importance. Yeah. Uh, to the to the individual of why they really need to do this they don't need to understand the complex words they don't need to understand the biochemistry but if i've given them a lot of pretty huge reasons to why they need to fix this problem they walk away because because basically education is empowering yeah like no one can tell me that it's not but if we keep on treating adults and keep on treating people like children how do you think children act if you tr if you constantly treat them as children, like children? Mm. Okay, I've refused to treat people like ch like children. Okay, I will educate them. They're not going to understand everything I, I I I talk about. I'm fine with that. But I need them to understand how important it is to take action and start to look after these things. They don't under, need to understand it like I do. My mind's a passion, yeah, okay? But they need to understand how important it is to take action, fix that problem so that they can better um, live their passions. That's a great place to bring this conversation to a close. Um, I think the last, the one thing that hasn't been talked about is for those who don't know, like you've been in this industry for 20 years, you, own, you co-own a Fifth Element Wellness a holistic gym um how's that how's that been going like for the you you got members and stuff who might be listening yeah. you got anything to update them on or you, anything you you want to say on that yeah look it's uh fifth element we've been going for six and a half years i mean obviously the ideology is sort of based on the whole aspect of there is not a monotherapy yeah. i mean i won't get into the weeds of all the different aspects there because pretty much i would say i've spoken a, 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 about a, a great majority of them yeah on this podcast yeah okay um but we you know we just don't believe in a monotherapy we need to, we, we believe that you need to look at stress management we need to you need to build strength okay because that's the seed yeah okay you need to look at m mobility so to help with things like blood flow and circulation and synovial fluid and hyaluronic acid and all these types of things you need to improve detoxification that doesn't just mean you go away and do a cleanse probably the worst thing you can do yeah okay um and it doesn't just involve your liver yeah okay it also Im involves your gastrointestinal tract yeah okay and uh, nutrition and gut health okay these are the fundamental things like and you start addressing all these problems 
that's not a monotherapy that requires you to address many many different aspects of your of your life okay um and that's what fifth the fifth element ideology is really really based on okay um and when i'm dealing with people that's the approach i use and the and the people that i get the best results with are the people that are prepared to adopt the majority of the those different aspects Mm -hmm. so the more they adopt the better the results they get it's just that simple yeah okay and so Yes, it's it's um, one aspect I would say has been tough, you know, um, during this time because obviously Fifth Element has been closed. Okay, there's been some good aspects for me because it's really really highlighted what really is the product of Fifth Element, and the, and the product of Fifth Element, the training is just a tool. That's all it is. Okay, it's not the product. We we probably are classified as a gym. But I never walk around Fifth Element and actually consider ourselves to be a gym. What do you consider it as? Where for me, where we are more like a holistic. I a lot of the time I used to say holistic gym, okay. But I would just say we're a wellness holistic center. Sure. Okay. The the big product of Fifth Element is the uniqueness of correlations of bloods that you're not going to get anywhere else. Yeah. Okay. That's stuff that I have constructed like a lot of people go you know when they've come to seminars and like where where can i learn this uh well right here they're my correlations okay (laughs) like i've constructed i know it's fine people find that hard to believe because they go oh it's just a a personal trainer he's just a strength and conditioning coach okay yeah i am okay but that doesn't mean i haven't gone away and just you like correlated bloods to stool and bloods to genetic testing and then I did that over a long, long period of time and noticed all these correlations. Yeah, okay. Um, you know, it's it's the uniqueness in the, the, the protocols behind healing the gut, which you're not going to get in a lot of, like my approach is, is very different. The, the approaches of healing the gut have really been based on um, sort of kill, okay, which means just go in and kill whatever, you know, that and that might be in the realms of antibiotics. Just go in there and just bomb, just nuclear bomb whatever's down there okay so that's just a kill approach and then that's it and then that just leaves all this damage okay it's like going in there and and dropping a nuclear bomb on a city like antibodies and then just doing nothing afterwards right yeah okay just go i'll just leave it yeah okay all right and so that's one approach just kill yeah okay there may be in more in the neutropathy realms yeah okay it's kill and then replenish okay and my approach just so people can understand is heal because you need to heal the gut lining first because that's why you've got the microbiome imbalances and that's why you've got the bacterial issues. Some would think heal would come after you kill. No, but you need to create a platform where the bacteria can no longer flourish. Got it. Please continue. Okay, so basically heal, kill, heal. Yep, makes okay? sense. Okay, it's basically my, my approach with the gut, yeah, okay? So these are unique and they're, they're very different approaches yeah okay um and so during this period of time this is just really highlighted to me you know when it comes to the training that we do with people it's based on these factors it's based on these issues okay we just go okay this person's got this problem they need to do more body weight training more calisthenics and more gymnastics the problem that they have internally the bacterial issues the biochemical imbalances will determine what course of action we're going to take from a periodization or a programming perspective. Hmm. That's so uncommon. Exactly. Okay. And so that, that is really what fifth element is about. You know, like we, we're, we're not a gym. Most people would think we are a gym. Yeah. Okay. Um, But that's probably what I would say to any of the, any of our members that are listening and, you know, um, if they like if they think we're a gym yeah okay like that's it's not it's not the desired goal of fifth element do yeah. you i'll be frank because uh we're, we're another three weeks into this right before yeah. gyms oh, could be gym. could be longer could yeah, yeah most likely will be let's yeah. let's plan for the yeah. realistic worst yeah so i mean people are concerned i'm sure people who are attached to you in your gym whether mm. you guys will, will come out of it or if you restructure um is do you have more clarity on, on where you and matt are thinking about that yeah i mean i think as i said it's highlighted um 
you know, and I, I, I can speak more from my perspective. Yeah, okay. Um, it's really highlighted to me what Fifth Element is all about and what the what what the real product is. Yeah, okay. And as I said, that's the uniqueness in how we address um, gut issues and health. Yeah, and and actually that will determine the 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 fitness journey. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay. And that's what this this whole thing. Because when this this whole thing erupted, yeah, okay, like I actually got busier. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's just fact. Yeah. Okay. Um, I mean. Same. So. It's weird. Yeah. So it it just I think it held up the mirror to a lot of people, and then they realize what's what's really important, which is your health. Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, in the fitness industry, have we always been focusing on that? Yeah. Okay. Well, a lot of the time it can be focused on aesthetics, and that doesn't always equate to health. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You know, even, you know, the best performance when it comes to athletic realms, that doesn't always equate to health as well. Yeah, okay? So um, I think what what you're going to see is this huge shift. And yes, people want the body composition results and that, but they want them both. They okay? want to feel good and look good. They're, they're, and they're going to want health first yeah. and the body composition comes with that, which is the way it should work anyway. Okay, and so that's. I just think you're gonna you're gonna see a huge awakening in even more people. This happening before, okay, and you're gonna see see it on even a bigger scale again. I've got no doubt about that. Yeah, okay, um, and I would say, you know, anyone in the fitness realms, anyone in the health realms, okay, you weather the storm, and post this, okay, is gonna be. Um, I think it's going to be amazing. Dave O'Brien, thank you, brother, so much for doing this. I think this is, guess. can you guess how long we've been doing this for? I don't want to guess, yeah. Uh, I'm assuming three (laughs) hours, maybe. Yeah, It's more than that. It's probably the longest podcast (laughs) I've probably ever done, and it's it's an absolute honor for me. I feel very privileged, very privileged to sit um, in front of you and, and you to even be willing to do this. I have a lot of gratitude for you and what you've done for this industry. Um, I think you're a beacon of light for this industry and all the people you've influenced. Uh, and I think no matter what happens with Fifth Element, um, y- you guys will be able to hang on the positivity and all the lives that you have changed and will continue to change. So thank you for that. Yeah, well, Alex, thank you for having me. Of um, and you know, I, I appreciate uh, you getting the message out to to more people, and yeah. I appreciate you having uh, faith in the process yourself and being being through it. Um, people taking that leap of faith, yeah. I've got more respect for people who take that leap of faith than than anyone. Because yeah. not not many do in the end. No. Where can uh, people find you if they want to learn more and? Uh yeah, well, I finally got on Instagram in about November. Yeah, okay. Um, so it's da- it's at dave dot o dot brian yeah okay um it's a bit long winded yeah okay but there's the dave o'brien's a pretty common name yeah okay um so people can uh you know check me out on instagram um and obviously we've got fifth element as well yeah okay and you can check out dave o'brien website www.daveobrien.com and then there's fifth element as well yeah okay um and that's www.5ew.com yeah okay yes i've got you know there's a book i'm bringing out this year it's called untapped yeah okay um what's the eta on that the it's it's getting because i had to put a lot of these things on the back burner look i'm hopefully around like october yeah okay well if you want some promotion love to have you back on yeah later in the year yeah great and then i've created a blood software which i'm massively excited about i'm not going to get into the weeds with that too much yeah okay but that's phenomenal it'll bring out all the real problems that that people have to address and they'll actually help with uh types of training that you should be doing and all this type of stuff and then there's the gut repairs the nine week 15 week i've actually created a vegan uh, vegetarian ebook yeah okay this out? it's just about to come out well, yeah, okay? just coming out um literally this within month? Uh, with I'm talking about like a week Shit. Yeah, okay and then I've created a ebook which is called nutrition foundations and nutrition foundations is that's all awesome. based on the findings of blood markers that's out too uh, about literally to be. about be about three weeks four weeks on that that one. is awesome yeah. okay 
well i'm gonna plug you like if any of you have any serious or moderate gut issues do what i did go see dave o'brien because there's really the reality is there's not many people out like you in this country let alone this state so if you're fed up with feeling shit and looking shit the guy sitting across me on this table can probably change your life so go see him thanks alex no problem thanks for having me thank you dave much gratitude (sighs) 